Hello and welcome to Science Live. I'm Veronica Maduna and I usually spend my days at Radio New Zealand co-producing a science and environment program called Our Changing World. But today I'm thrilled to be here at the National Museum of New Zealand, Te Papa Tungaruva, in Wellington, New Zealand's lovely capital city, for a very special live webcast. As you can see, we're not in the museum space itself. We are in a different building that is home to Te Papa's collections and laboratories. And most of the action today will happen next door in the lab next door. There's a huge tank and in that tank is an enormous and extraordinary creature. Everybody here has been getting quite excited about it and Te Papa is very grateful to have received a colossal squid specimen. This one was caught a few months ago in the Ross Sea, just off the continent of Antarctica, then was brought back to New Zealand and it's been in a huge freezer since, in fact, until yesterday morning when staff here brought it out and it was defrosting since then ever so slowly to be ready for today's examination. If you've visited Te Papa, you'll know that Te Papa already has a colossal squid. It's on display in the natural history galleries on the first level. Now, since that's gone on display in 2008, four and a half million people have come to see it. That squid on display and the colossal squid out there in the laboratory are the only two ever to have come up to the surface intact and in a condition that is good enough for scientists to study them. So you can imagine it's quite an exciting and rare opportunity for scientists to do this today. We've known that colossal squid exist for quite a while, since 1925 in fact, so that's almost 90 years. But so far scientists have had to glean information from remains of colossal squid that turns up in the stomachs of sperm whales or from the imprints that the squid leave on the whale's skin. So much about the basic biology still remains a mystery. So we'll soon be joined by a team of squid experts from the Auckland University of Technology. They've come to help with the research today here. And we can watch them. You can join us to watch them. We'll bring them in here to talk to them. And you can also send in your questions. So if you've got squid questions, please email to sciencelive at tipapa .govt.nz. If you're on Twitter, you can use the hashtags SquidWatch or Science Life Te Papa, or you can go to the webpage to Te Papa's blog page and leave a comment there. We'll be picking up those questions, and if you send them in quick, we'll be able to answer them during this session. So just before we kick off, let me introduce you to Dr. Susan Wall. Susan, thanks for joining us. Hi, Veronica. Hi. Susan is the Senior Curator Sciences at Te Papa, and I'd quite like to find out a bit more about Te Papa's collections. Today, all eyes will be on the colossal squid, and it's probably the rarest specimen. But if I were to walk through here, open some drawers and cabinets, what else would I find? So we have um, an amazing state-of-the-art facility here in Wellington where we um, can examine all um, kinds of things about the biodiversity of New Zealand's um, natural heritage. So we have um, about half a million registered specimen lots here in the collections facility that are marine invertebrates, insects, plants, um, animals, and of course um, things like the squid and fishes. So everything's represented, all branches of the animal king kingdom and plants as well? Yes, we cover all of the biota um, that's found in New Zealand with the exception of fungi. How can those collections help scientists to answer research questions? Well, the collections are a little bit like a library in that you can take a book off the shelf and read it and come back to it several years later and re-look at it and find new information. So we're um, resampling specimens that were collected 100 years ago and re-looking at the relationships between um, different plants and animals um, and unpicking things about their natural history, um, their relationships, their evolution, um, using old specimens and using freshly caught ones. One of those research results I remember quite recently was the examination or the sampling of rather old bones of Madagascar's elephant bird and that rewrote the evolutionary history of the kiwi. That's right. Um, so we recently had findings from Alan Cooper's research group who are based in Australia and they used um, specimens that were held in Te Papa's collections here that looked at over 100 year old um, bones and found that the relationship between kiwi and this bird from Madagascar was closer than you would find between kiwi and moa, which was the kind of accepted wisdom to that point. You work with seabirds. Is there a particular specimen in this collection that is your favourite? 
Oh, sure. Um, we've got a, an amazing collection of seabirds here at Te Papa, and that's the, really the legacy of several curators who've done a great job of building up the, the collection over time. Um, we've got one of the world's best seabird collections. And for me, um, probably the Royal Albatross would be my favourite. They're definitely um, the king of birds in New Zealand, um, and they, um, they're endemic to New Zealand, magnificent bird, and we've got several um, beautiful specimens here that we hope to put on display shortly to share with the public. How often does Te Papa make discoveries? Things that have either never been seen or new connections? Well, you'd think it was um, something that was pretty difficult to do, but actually because we've got a really strong research group um, working here across all kinds of biota, um, we're making discoveries quite regularly. So um, at a rate of about three, every three weeks, we describe a new species for the New Zealand region. Thank you, that's amazing rate, really. Thanks, Susan, for joining us now. I'd like to bring you back a bit later when we start answering questions that have come in from schools. But for now, let's have a little look at what goes on tank side. Hello again, and let me now introduce you to our next guest, who we're very lucky to have here today with us. If you've tuned in earlier, I, you might recall that I was saying that this colossal squid out in a tank is only one of two that have ever been brought to the surface intact and in a condition that's good enough for scientists to actually study. Now, both these colossal squid have been caught by one man, John Bennett, who's the skipper of the fishing vessel San Aspiring, and he is joining us now. John... We're lucky to have you because we, you probably don't spend much time on land. No, not really, no. It's a pleasure to be here. And, uh, and yeah, I've spent uh, many years fishing in Antarctica and I think uh, 15 years now. So, um, yeah, if anybody's uh, probably going to catch a colossal squid, it's possibly me, I guess. <laughs> Still, I mean, there's only <clears throat> two that have come up in this condition. Have you got a special trick up your sleeve or is it really just that they turn up with the fishery? I think um, uh, a few of the other operators have seen have seen colossal squid come up um, in the same manner that we have. Um, but um, I guess um, the trick is to be prepared to um, to deal with them when they come alongside, and um, it, the conditions have to be right. It needs to be flat, calm, and um, yeah, when everything works well, it, it all happens. So, so you actually had to stop the operations to get the colossal squid up? Definitely, yeah. We have to um, totally stop hauling our line and and, um, and then just focus on, on 
getting getting a cargo net underneath the squid and um, carefully lifted aboard and um, to, to, to retain it in such good condition. Perhaps you could explain, because you were down in the Ross Sea fishing for toothfish, but perhaps you could explain the, the method or technique you used to do that. Okay, we, we, we use um, uh, long lines, um, and the system that we, we operate is a, a mustard long line system. And uh, the lines are, are about four miles long, each one, and, um, and with about 8,000 hooks on each line. Uh, we'll set uh, three or four lines a day. And um, at, during the, the process the, of um, hauling the lines aboard, that's when the, the squid attack the fish that are on the, on the line, and, um, and that's when they come up to the surface. And, and so how deep do you let the line drop? Because obviously the, the colossal squid is a deep sea creature. So how deep do you go? Our lines are set between um, sort of 1,200 and 1,800 metres, uh, which is uh, about our target depth. So I think this one was, uh, was caught in about 1,500 metres. So this is where the toothfish are, but obviously the squid like eating the toothfish? Yes, definitely, yeah. Now on this day, uh, the squid were eating the, the, the toothfish, and other occasions we've seen um, um, squid inside the toothfish, um, which clearly shows the battle's gone the other way. And um, so, yeah, quite often we'll get seven or eight um, toothfish in a row that have had big chunks of squid inside them. You could have just cut that line and continued fishing, but you, you know, of all people, you know, knew how important this would be to, to others around here. That's right. Well, Sanford's and, um, and our team are very, very passionate about advancing the, um, uh, the fishery in, in the best way possible. And it's not only about um, scientific um, data for toothfish, it's about everything in the, in the Ross Sea and the Antarctic environment. And uh, we bring home samples of all sorts of things, from starfish to shells and crabs. And, and uh, yeah, to bring home a, a, another colossal squid um, is, uh, is really quite exciting. It makes us feel as though we're sort of part of the process and um, helping to d develop a, a good fishery. We do have a map just here behind us. Could you just briefly point where you were? Where's the Ross Sea? So if you're leaving New Zealand so, so from Bluff? From, uh, from Timaru, um, usually in about um, the 20th of uh, November each year. And uh, we, we steam down past um, Campbell Island and down to the Ross Ice Edge, or the, down to the, to the Ice Edge, I guess. And um, in the early part of the season, as the ice starts to thaw, we make our way into the Ross Sea. And uh, usually by about Christmas time and New Year, we, we're on the, on the inner Ross Sea when, in the, inside the Polynia, which is um, where the colossal squid was caught. We do also have a map that you can just see um, now that shows you the place where you caught the um, colossal squid. So these, these images are thanks to Sanford's and the San Aspiring crew. Can you tell us a little bit about, do you get still excited when you see something like that coming up? Because you spend so many days, weeks, months at sea. Do you still get excited by seeing the life? Oh, definitely. Um, um, I'm a career fisherman and, and anything different um, is, uh, is great to be a part of, um, whether it's extreme weather or um, just just something, an iceberg or something completely different. It's, um, it's great to be a part of it. Um, We've worked hard over the years to um, have uh, best seabird um, practice and we have not caught a single seabird in the Ross Sea uh, fishery at all. It's uh, 15 years of fishing. So. so that was a big issue, this bycatch issue of the long line fishery in particular. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. And the same in, in South Georgia as well. So um, a, lot of, um, a lot of the problems that we had uh, 20, 30 years ago uh, have now been eliminated in, in, in that aspect. And it's um, really good to be part of a system that's working. And I guess when you come back home to your family, it's perhaps not so much the stories about the fishing, but about all the other creatures that you get to see that you then bring home with you. Mm. Um, I've got uh, four little grandchildren that are growing up and running around now, and and, and uh, very very keen to know about um, uh, colossal squids, and and uh, and sort of those stories are going to grow as they get older. Uh, one of my uh, granddaughters was here at Te Papa just uh, two weeks ago, actually looking at the squid. So uh, yeah, it's it's really neat to know that. Um, you know, I can have a, uh, something to do with that process. And uh, yeah. how much of your time do you spend at sea? 
Is it like 50-50 or how much you know, dry days do you have? I think uh, in the early days it was more than 50% of my time and now it's um, yeah, might probably a little bit later, but a little bit less. But um, yeah, um, like, like most fishermen, um, um, I, I spend about half my time at sea. And, uh, so it is a second home or is it your first home really? Oh, no, it'd have to be my second home, but uh, yeah, I know it well. <laughs> Yeah. When are you heading back? You just here for a short break between seasons? I've just uh, finished um, um, a campaign in South Georgia, uh, where I've been there for three months. I just brought the ship back to uh, to Timaru, and um, I'll be off now until um, until about January, and then I'll be away to South Georgia again. So I won't be going to the Ross Sea this time, the first time in 15 years that I haven't. So I'm looking forward so, to a summer at home. Yeah. So we're not expecting another colossal squid no, from you. No, no, no. But this one, how did it come to Te Papa? You knew it's going to be an important find, so you decided to bring it up carefully. And then it was donated to Te Papa, or how does it come here? Yeah, it's, um, we, we brought it uh, up to Timaru and unloaded it into the cool store. And then, um, and yeah, it's just, uh, we Sanfords have donated it to Te Papa as, um, for a scientific um, analysis and display if necessary. So, uh, yep, uh, and, we're, and we're passionate about getting getting these samples and keeping them in as in as um, as you know good um, shape and um, condition as we possibly can. So that in the end, other people can study and see them too. Thank you very much, John. That's fantastic. I would also like you to come back a little later because we've been getting questions from schools throughout the country, and I'm sure that you'll be able to answer some of those. Okay. But thanks very much for your time now, and we'll just go back to Tankside to have another look what's going on there.
Hello again and um, welcome to Science Live. If you've just tuned in, if you've just joined us, we are here live behind the scenes at Te Papa getting ready for an examination of a colossal squid. It's in the lab next door in a huge tank there. Now to do this, we've got a team from the Auckland University of Technology, a team of squid experts here. And I'll introduce you to Kat Bolstead, who brought her team here to Te Papa to do this work. Um, Kat, you're with, the, with AUT's Institute of Applied Ecology, but you lead a group of people studying cephalopods specifically. Yes, yes. Now, this is a group that squids belong to, but it also has other creatures in it. Can you just perhaps introduce that group first? Sure. So cephalopods are a group of mollusks that have um, a, a crown of arms and a beak uh, and a head, and they're sort of attached to a sac-like body that's got all the organs inside. So most people would be familiar with octopuses and squids. Um, it also includes nautiluses, a group called vampire squids as well, and cuttlefish, which we don't have in New Zealand. But we do have vampire squids? We do have vampire squids, yep. They're a funny little sort of dark red, black, gelatinous thing, very primitive, um, sort of a, a bit like a, a, an old old cross between an octopus and a squid. Octopuses and squid, how closely related are they? Um, octopuses and squid are not terribly closely related. They actually split apart evolutionarily um, somewhere between the time that um, birds and reptiles split and birds and mammals. So they're sort of that level of, of separate. So actually much further apart than most people imagine. Yeah. I mean, I would be one who would put them quite close together, often confused and possibly even too. Yes, I mean, you know, they look very similar to each other. Um, and there, there's some generalizations that you could make about them. I mean, generally, octopuses are kind of round and they live on the bottom and they crawl around and squid are sort of pointy and they live in the midwater and they, they swim um, in the, the way that people are familiar with. Um, but there's actually only one difference that's true between every single octopus and every, every single squid, and that is that an octopus has got um, flat, fleshy suckers that don't have any kind of hooks or rings inside them. They're very sensitive to touch, um, and they have a lot of chemoreceptors, so they can sort of taste or smell things with their suckers. And, oct and um, squid, by contrast, um, have got sort of a, a spherical sucker that always has some kind of tooth ring or hook inside it. Um, but there are lots of generalizations you could make as well. Um, they, it, octopuses are quite intelligent. Squid are sadly not so intelligent, but still very interesting. Um, they make up for it in other ways, I'm sure. Yeah, and the other really common thing that, that separates most squid and octopus is that squid have got fins uh, and tentacles. So in addition to those eight arms, they've got these two long tentacles with hooks or suckers at the ends of them as well, and octopus never have that. So you just mentioned the hard bits in the squid's mm. suckers, which means that I always think of them as an invertebrate, something that doesn't have any skeleton of any kind as we know it, but obviously they do have heart pits. Are they still the world's largest, heaviest invertebrate? Absolutely. The colossal squid weighs up to between 400 and 500 kilos, which far out outweighs anything else that we know of. Um, it's not the longest. The giant squid is still quite a bit longer, but it's a bit spindly by comparison. So the colossal squid is very bulky and heavy. Um, and very massive, but it's, it only reaches a maximum like probably of maybe four or five meters. We'll soon look at it close up, but perhaps if you had to draw up a basic body plan of a squid, what are the sort of bits? So what you would see if you just had a, a sort of standard squid laid out, and we'll, we'll do a, a dissection of a more, more common squid a bit later to show people, um, you'd see the, the fins at one end, which are one of the ways that the animal swims, um, and those are attached to the tube-shaped body, which is full of um, all of the organs inside the digestive and reproductive things. Um, and that tube is what actually gets cut into cross-sections to make squid rings. And then the body is connected to the head, and like your head, the head has got the eyes and the mouth and the brain inside it. Uh, and then at the... the end of the head um, surrounding the beak or the mouth is the arm crown and that would be the arms and the tentacles. So that's your, your basic squid in a nutshell. Thank you for that. Now, from the first one that's on display now, scientists have been able to examine that as well. Are you hoping to get something new, different from this one that you haven't been able to glean from the first one? Yeah, we are. We're, we're hoping to um, sort of answer a lot of questions or start to find answers to a lot of scientific questions about this one. So it was spectacular to examine the first one. It was a, a perfect, beautiful specimen as well. But we were aware that a lot of the value of that specimen was going to be 
putting it on display. So we tried to keep it as perfect as we possibly could, which meant that we didn't really do any invasive sampling of it. Um, and this one, similarly, we're not actually dissecting. We're going to take some samples of it, but we also want to keep it in very good shape because we're not quite sure yet what's going to happen with it afterwards. So um, it might become part of the collections. It might go on display. We're not going to do anything that would ruin it for either of those purposes, but we do have a lot of questions that we want to try to answer. So we have many different projects that we'll be collecting samples for today. What's the most burning question? for you? What's on top of your mind that you really, really want to find out today? Well, mostly we want to find out more about how this animal fits into the ecosystem that it lives in. So we know a little bit about what it eats, a little bit about what eats it, but not a lot of information. And so we, we're going to try to find some information about those questions in different ways. Um, and then a lot of, really, a lot of different projects. So in the first session that we'll have on soon, you'll be looking at basics about body plan, size. Can you actually weigh it? the way it is at the moment? Not really. What we can do is we know what the volume of the water in the tank is, and from the change in volume from the time we put the squid in, then we can estimate what the volume of the squid is. And the squid should be reasonably neutrally buoyant, so it should have about the same density as water, which means we could make a rough estimate of its weight based on that, but we haven't done that yet. Now, you mentioned the giant squid earlier. The giant, the colossal squid, they, you know, both are the biggest and one way or another either the longest or the heaviest. There's a lot of mythology and legends around these larger squids. Could they be big enough to really swallow up a submarine? <laughs> Sadly, I'm going to have to dispel that. Um, no, well, no, they're not. No, is, is the frank answer. I mean, if you had, even if you had a very large animal at the surface, it just doesn't have the ability to get the arms out of the water. I mean, if you've ever tried to raise most, most of yourself out of the water floating, it's, it's a very hard thing to do and, you know, try that without any bones. Um, so we know that they get very large, um, but they're not going to be capsizing anything more than uh, perhaps a small kayak, but not a lot of people kayak in the Antarctic, so that's probably fairly safe. Um, and they're certainly not going to be winning any fights with sperm whales. So they're not the monster of the deep sea, but a very interesting creature of the deep sea. Just let me ask you, because it's a very rare opportunity to see an intact specimen, how else can you study colossal squid? Um, we can, well, we can study small ones a bit, so we know that the, the very large ones are only eaten really by sperm whales and sleeper sharks that we're aware of. The smaller ones are eaten by a number of other animals, including seabirds and some fish, so there's been, um, there have been some pretty good diet studies on certain kinds of albatrosses and petrels and, and seabirds that would eat these animals, so based on sort of the incidence of beaks of this animal, because you can identify beaks to species, um, we can tell a bit about where it likely lives and sort of depths, obviously, if seabirds are, are eating the smaller sizes, those are not living at hundreds and hundreds of meters because seabirds are not diving that deep. Um, and similarly, you know, we know that they sometimes occur in the stomachs of Patagonian toothfish, so sometimes the toothfish gets its revenge and gets a nice bite of squid as well. Um, and we, we've got a lot of information actually from um, the diets of toothed whales. So sperm whales in particular we know eat a huge number of colossal squid in the Antarctic. Um, and that's one of the ways that we can sort of guess what the maximum size for the animal might be because the ones we've seen have not had beaks exactly as big as the biggest beaks known from whale stomachs. So we know they must get slightly bigger than the ones we've seen. Would you find the giant and the colossal squid in the same environment or are they closely related? They're not closely related. Um, they're both squid, but they come from different families. So the giant squid comes from its own family, a family called Architeuthidae, um, and they live throughout the world's temperate and tropical oceans, um, down usually below about 300 meters. Um, so we have them in New Zealand, and they occur sort of throughout the rest of the world, but not in the Antarctic. And the colossal squid only lives in the Antarctic, and it comes from a much more diverse family. So there are lots and lots of species, possibly up to 60 species in this family, and quite a few of them not known yet. So one of my PhD students is looking at that particular group of squids. Um, but they're, So they're about as closely related maybe as cats and dogs would be to each other. So again, it's quite far apart, really. Yeah. And we'll be speaking to your, your PhD students later on. Yeah. So at this point I say thanks, and I know you that you can't wait to get to work on the Colossal Squid, but could I please keep you here for just a little longer sure because thing. we've been getting lots of questions from schools sure. leading up to this session, and we'd like to start answering some of those. So let me introduce you to Scott Ogilvy. And Scott is the senior educator to Papa. That's right. And he will get us going with some of the questions. Thank you very much. I'll leave you to it. Thank you, Veronica. Hello. Hi, Kat. Um, it's great to be 
in the presence of a squid expert like yourself. Um, and as Veronica mentioned, we've had lots of questions coming in from schools over the last couple of weeks. Excellent. They're very excited to learn more about the colossal squid. So I've got a few to put to you now, so sure we'll, get, we'll get straight into it. Um, the first couple of questions... I've come in from room G1, uh, from, they're a year six class in, at Eastern Hut School in Lower Hut. And the first question I'd like to know is how big are these squid when they're born? We've seen them at Tapapa, we've, we've seen one at Tapapa, it's just under five metres long, but mm. obviously they're not that big when they're born. So how big are they when they're born? They're absolutely tiny when they're born. Um, we don't know for sure because we haven't seen a female colossal squid that's got eggs that are ready to go, and we don't know whether those eggs then would do a bit of growing afterwards. But um, we know that the eggs of some others of the same family are maybe a couple millimetres meters long. And so colossal squid probably are not more than maybe two or three millimeters long when they're born. So they have to get from that size to the size that you see out there. But uh, how long that takes is another mystery, actually. We don't know what their lifespan is. Okay. Um, so a lot of growing does get done, though. A lot of growing does get done. They have to eat a lot of stuff. Our next question from the same class, also to do with the size of the squid, they want to know why is it so big? Is this a mutated smaller squid or is this a completely different species of squid? Uh, well, it's completely different from sort of your, your common squid or the, the arrow squid that you might have on the table. Um, there are quite a few animals that live in the deep sea have sort of a, a strategy of growing quite large. It's called bathyal gigantism, and it just means that things, some things that live in the deep sea grow much larger than their, their close relatives that live in shallower waters. Um, and the, the reason that that seems to have developed is that the larger you are, the fewer things can eat you. So, you know, it's not, it's not like the squid sets out to say, well, I'm going to get really big because then things won't eat me. Um, but animals that attain a certain size have fewer predators, and so they would tend to stick around longer and things would, might evolve in that direction. So, um, so for the colossal squid at large sizes, that's worked very well. So far, only sperm whales and sleeper sharks seem to be able to take down a large colossal squid. It's quite lucky for the squid. Very lucky for the squid. Um, so we'll move on, uh, away from the size now. Mm. And room seven at Nio School uh, would like to know, how old is the squid and how can you tell? Uh, that's a great question and one that we hope to get some more information about today. So um, we, we don't actually know what the lifespan of the colossal squid is. The ways that you can sort of estimate age in squids uh, are that within the body they have a couple of different hard parts. They have uh, the lens of their eye, they have two little bones in their head called statoliths, um, and they've got the pen or the gladius that runs along the back. And those structures all have growth rings in them like you would see in a tree's trunk. Uh, and you can count those. The problem is if you don't know how often and the rings are laid down, you can't say what the rings mean. So what we know is for all species where that's been verified so far, the little bones in the head have growth rings that suggest a lifespan of under two years. So we think those rings are laid down on a daily basis, and that would mean that they were getting from tiny to massive in about two years, but we can't say for sure. In order to know how often the rings are laid down, you have to keep them in captivity for a bit, and clearly that's a little bit beyond where we are so far. Indeed it is, yes. But um, So it's all to do with counting rings in, in specific bits of the squid. It is, yep. Great. Um, and oh, well, this is also about the age, which we don't know a great deal about yet, but um, room 11 at Nio School wanted to know what is the oldest a colossal squid can be. Can we have an estimate at that, maybe? Well, so um, we've, we've done a bit of work on this in giant squids, um, and... Again, without knowing how often the rings are laid down, we can't be exact, but um, depending how you interpret it, the, the different structures give different estimates of what the age might be. So um, if you count the eye lens, it says one thing and the gladius says another, and so one of the estimates is about six years, one of the estimates is about 13 years, um, and either of those would make slightly more sense as you know a, a time in which the animal could reach the size that it does. Now, just recently, scientists at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute in California have observed a deep sea octopus brooding her eggs for four and a half years. And that's far beyond the known lifespan, the entire lifespan of any other cephalopod that we know so far. Uh, and brooding normally takes about a quarter of an animal's life. So if that's true, then that octopus would be living for 20 years, and that's well beyond anything we'd ever imagined. So in some ways, that question just sort of got thrown out the window by some new findings. So watch this space. <laughs> Indeed, we'll watch this space and hopefully you might find some more out about the age of a squid. Absolutely. We've got one last very quick question before we're going to let you get into, your, get into the tank. Um, and what is the scientific name of a colossal squid? 
It's called Mesonicatuthis hamiltoni, and the, that long genus name, Mesonicatuthis, just means that it's got hooks in the middle of the arms, and that makes it actually unique among all squids. So it has suckers at the start of the arms, then hooks, and then more suckers. So that name means it's got suckers in the middle of the arms. And hamiltoni is named after someone named Hamilton. Okay, thank you. Um, and that was that question came in from, from Summerland School, so hopefully that answered the question for them. We're going to let you go now, Kat. Um, I know you've got lots of work to do with the squid out there in the tank, so thank you very much. Thank you. And I'm sure we'll see you again later on. All right. Um, moving along, we've still got a lot more questions to answer. We're going to um, direct some questions now at Dr. Susan War, our science curator from Te Papa. And we met her earlier. We brought her back to answer a couple more questions that have been coming in. Hi, Scott, and hi to the students who are out there watching us. And first up, well, actually, all the questions for you are from Eastern Hutt School in Lower Hutt, or from G1, room G1. How excited were you when this colossal squid was discovered? Oh, we were really excited, and we thought up all sorts of good reasons why we needed to keep it here in the Te Papa collections. Um, and we're really, really grateful that um, the fishing crew and um, people involved in the fishery decided to bring it back for us so we can start to answer some pretty hard science questions with it. Excellent. Um, so, on how long will the squid be okay for after it's, uh, after it's been defrosted? I know we started defrosting it yesterday. Um, how long will it be okay? How long have we got to, to study it before it's got to be preserved? Well, we've really only got a few hours. So, as you can imagine, if you had um, something like free um, chicken or some vegetables that you took out of your freezer, you probably wouldn't want to eat them after maybe a day or so of defrosting. And so it's a bit the same with the squid. It, its material starts to decay and go rotten if we keep it too long. So some of the samples that we read really um, pristine material for, we take those immediately as soon as the tissue is even a little bit soft. So genetic samples um, and things to look at the, bi the biochemistry of the animal. Um, so so we've probably got about um, 12, 24 hours at max, and then we really have to get it pickled and ready to um, go into the collections. Okay, great. Um, so we'll have to be working quite quickly on the squid to learn as much as we can in those 12, 24 That's hours. Right, yeah. Um, so it's out there, it's, it's been defrosted, we're obviously studying it today. What happens to the squid next? What happens after the examination is completed? Sure, so after Kat and her team um, have finished sampling it and measuring it and so forth, um, we'll be putting it into a bath of formalin. So we change the water out and put formalin in, which um, kind of rubberizes the tissue. It, it transforms the protein in the tissue and um, puts it into a far more stable state that won't decay. And then after it's been soaked in that for about um, two months, then we transfer it into another um, compound called monopropylene glycol and that essentially keeps it very stable and we possibly can keep it for hundreds of years at that point and that'll mean we can keep it in the collections for scientific study or we could put it on display. Great, so hundreds, hundreds more years for this colossal squid. Yeah, we hope so. That's our aim. Great. Thank you, Susan. Um, that's all the questions we had from room G1 um, at, at Eastern Hutt School. Um, we've got a couple more questions to direct at someone else who has also joined us already on camera. We're going to um, call, call back John Bennett. Um, who was the skipper of the San Aspiring, the fishing vessel that caught the colossal squid down in the Ross Sea. Welcome back, John. Hello, mate. <coughs> it's a pleasure to be here. So we've got a few questions that have come in for you, I think specifically because you're really the only person here today who's seen the colossal squid alive. Mm -hmm. um, so some of the questions will be directed to those, to those kind of things. But first of all, how did you catch the squid and then how did you freeze it once you caught it? Well, it was caught on, on a long line in our normal operation of fishing. So the, the line is about um, about four miles long and um, approximately sort of seven to 8,000 hooks on it. And uh, the toothfish come along and, and, and bite the bait. And, uh, and, I, and then the colossal squid comes along and, and catches the toothfish uh, while it's tethered to the hook. So uh, it's an easy feed for the, for the, uh, for the colossal squid. And uh, he was determined not to let go. And uh, he held on to the, the toothfish <clears throat> while it was hauled to the surface, um, about 1,500 metres, nearly a mile down. So, um, yeah, he had, uh, during that time, he had a good old feed on the, on the toothfish as it was coming up to the surface. And at the same time, he'd probably been attacked by some of the other fish as well while he was hanging on to it. So <clears throat> he, was, um, he was showing signs of, um, of, of definite signs of being, uh, being attacked and... It was, it was actually dying by the time he got to the surface. OK, it must have been quite a tasty fish for it to put up such a fight to keep a hold of it. I would say so, yeah. yeah. So um, you came up to the surface as you were pulling your, your long line in. Mm -hmm. How did you then get it from the ocean into the boat? Um, we really need... Um, 
this, because they're, they're quite delicate and uh, they're not easy to lift, uh, it was important for us to get a net underneath the, the, the squid um, and um, we used a cargo net that we had on board and we, 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 uh, we put it underneath and then put our big crane and lifted it, lifted it aboard with a crane. So, um, yeah, it, it, uh, we need to have perfect conditions for that. Uh, in the Ross Sea, occasionally we get uh, flat, calm conditions, although it's very cold. The water temperature is about minus 1.5, so I guess we don't have to freeze it very hard for it to freeze. It's just about half frozen anyway. Um, but it was lifted onto the deck of the ship. The air temperature um, there was um, about zero. And um, after another half an hour, I suppose, we took some photographs and then carefully lowered into a, a, a big... Um, cube, an IBC we call them, they're just a, a plastic container, and uh, lifted it straight down into the hold, uh, into, the, into the main freezer, and uh, there it froze in about um, six hours. Oh, great, so obviously a very big freezer needed to freeze a very big squid. It is, it is a large hold, and I think uh, um, in total it holds about 350 tonnes or something. Oh, good. Um, so I think you did um, did mention the depth uh, you caught the squid. That was a, a question specifically from Room 11 at NIO School. Mm. Wanted to know about that. So maybe just for those students again, can you just tell us at what depth did you catch this squid from? The average, the average fish, um, the average depth that we operate in, in the Ross Sea is between about 1,200 to 1,800 metres. So uh, 1,800 metres is just on a mile down. But I think this one, um, the, the line has settled on the bottom and about... 1500, 1500 metres thereabouts, so um, yeah, it's, it's a long way down. I think um, the visible light disappears at 600 metres or something, so it'll be pitch black down there, and, um, and all sorts of fish running around with their little, um, little, producing their own light pretty much. Yeah. All right, thank you very much. And we've got a final question um, that's coming in from Jordan, who's a 16 year old with a, a huge curiosity in colossal squid. Um, and he'd like to know a bit about the, the, the squid's eyeballs. We tell people at Tapapa they're, they're very large eyeballs. Um, and he'd like to know exactly what, is it, what does a squid eye look like? Well, it's very difficult for us to uh, ascertain that um, from our point. It's probably better now uh, that it's uh, here in the tank. We'll, we'll, as it thaws out, we'll have a, have a closer look. When it's alongside the, the ship and we're getting the net around it to put it in, we didn't really have too much time to sort of examine. But... Uh, the, the item is a sight that I've seen of it. Uh, they're very large, very large. Uh, they're, they're black eye, and um, yeah, that's uh, that's that's pretty much it. The, 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 the eye on this one is is, is really quite huge. But, but um, getting close up, now's our chance as it thaws out, I think. Yeah, yeah that's right. So um, hopefully, Jordan, you're watching. We might find that out later on, and you'll see just what a colossal squid eye looks like. Um, that's all the questions we've got for you for now, John. So thank you very much. Thank you. So you may have some more questions now after watching those questions get answered or by watching already today. Um, you can send your questions in to us in a, new, a number of ways. If you're on Twitter, you can send us your, your questions using the, the hashtag SquidWatch or ScienceLive to Papa. And you can email your questions to ScienceLive at tapapa.govt.nz or send the questions in via our Tapapa blog using the comment section there. But right now, we are ready to cross back over to the tank to have a look at what's going on out there and learn more about the colossal... Hello, Beck. We're now at tank side with the colossal squid. Shall we turn this on? That's much better. You'll be able to hear us. We're now at tank side with the colossal squid here. And Kat's been um, starting the examination. Kate, you mentioned when we talked earlier, you mentioned that this belongs to the glass squid. Nothing I would associate with glass when I look at this. Well, this is a very unusual animal for the family that it's in. So most of the, most of the um, squids in the family, Cranchiidae or the glass squids, um, are much smaller than this, and they're called that by their common name um, because they are completely transparent apart from a few structures in the body. So they, some of them you know, they have light organs inside, and they actually look like little light bulbs because they've got just this, this clear, beautiful, transparent mantle on the outside and then just a few things inside and a bit of glowing stuff. So we don't 
actually know whether the colossal squid is able to be as transparent as some of its smaller cousins or not, um, but it definitely belongs to this family. It's got things in common with them that no other squid family has. Um, but that's one of the things that Aaron's going to be looking at for his PhD. So um, it is, it's the very largest specimen, and it's far, far larger than any other species in this family. So it is quite an unusual one. Do we know how common it is? We know it lives in the Antarctic waters off Antarctica, Ross Sea, Southern Ocean. We know sperm whales eat it. What else do we know? How common is it in those waters? So the only information we really have about its abundance is what we can figure out from predators and from how many things eat it and how much of it they eat. And the, the most amazing statistic about it really is that it's been estimated that sperm whales, when they're down in the Antarctic, eat about 80% of their diet is made up of this species by weight. And a healthy male sperm whale eats between one and one and a half tons of squid and other things every day. So that's a lot of colossal squid. You don't need to do maths to think that there must be lots of it all in deep waters, in the deep ocean. Well, sperm whales can dive down to uh, about 2,000 meters, so they, they can forage sort of all the way through that zone where we think this animal is living. Yep. So when you're just about to start mm -hmm. the first sampling session, what will you be looking at? Um, we're we're going to start out by just having a good look at sort of the overall outer surface of the animal. So at, at the moment, um, it's a little bit curled up. It's just defrosting in the middle. Um, but we've got the head sort of upside down. So what we're looking at is the underside. The funnel is there. Um, and so we're going to start out by counting and measuring some things that we can see and just looking very carefully over the surfaces that we can see to see whether anything um, interesting there needs to be sampled or if we can find parasites or implanted sperm or anything like that. Can you point out the fins to me? and perhaps explain how it moves? Um, I could if you had a snorkel. <laughs> so the, the, I mean, anim the animal is currently folded over and the fins are lying on the very bottom of the tank. But they are so large that they make up almost the entire outline of what you can see. So everything you can see here is sitting on fin and the fins are pretty much this size but they're lying underneath. So we're hoping after just a little bit more thawing happens that we can unfold them and you'll be able to appreciate how large they are. Fantastic. Thank you, Kat. I'll let you get on with it, and perhaps you can just keep us right. posted as you go through it. Thank Fantastic. you. very important specimen for Aaron. Um, it's his first large colossal squid. He's seen a few small ones. Uh, and he's going to come down and have a look uh, in particular at some of the features that make this animal um, unique. And that's the, the toothed suckers followed by the hooks and the suckers. So we're going to look really closely at the arms now. And we'll try to give everyone a good look at, um, at those suckers and hooks. And uh, we'll sort of explore down around the head. We know the beak is still in there, but we're not going to take it out quite yet. Um, and we'll just sort of see what we can tell about it from looking at the surfaces that are up at the moment. So I'm going to put my long gloves on as well. Maybe I'll put them on the right hands. I got it. I think what we might do is we'll turn it a little bit so that it's toward you, so that you're not between the squid and the So we're just going to bring the arms around a little bit so that we can show them to you from over here. We'll do some of what big squid, big squid scientists love to do, which is measure things and count things. The white bit that you can see, I'll bring this up just a little bit. The white bit that you can see here is one of the two light organs. So that's the smaller light organ. The eye is completely intact inside. The lens is still there. There's a small light organ here, and there's a much larger light organ that goes all the way around the inside of the eye, inside the head. And uh, we've got the, the funnel is here. So we're looking at the ventral surface of the animal. This is the kind of the belly. Um, and the funnel is here. This is one of the ways that the animal can swim, is to fill the mantle with water and then shoot it out the funnel. So this one has got a, a nice big funnel, which it can point in any direction. It can move equally well in most directions. 
And then the arms down here surround the beak. So um, we'll show you the beak a bit later, but um, we do have some, some nice chunky arms. They've got beautiful suckers on them. And then in the middle here, you can see the hooks, the sort of famous hooks that we talk about on this animal. So I think we'll, uh, we'll start with the very bottom. Squid have got eight arms, um, and they're numbered from the top down, one, two, three, four. So we're looking at the bottom, so we're going to start by looking at that bottom set of arms, arms four. Uh, and we're just going to find out how many hooks and suckers it's got on it. <laughs> My tweezers just went in the water. <laughs> yeah, it's okay, though. I've got others. Okay. So I think you've got one there. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, so you want me to hold them over? You can count. Sure. Right. So this, this is the right side, side of the animal. Okay. Okay. Those would have been suckers. And um, 
this membrane is particularly thick um, around the hooks, so we think that probably they can fold the membrane closed a bit and sort of shudder off the hooks a little bit so that it doesn't catch itself necessarily when it's got all the arms held together. And what we seem to have at the tip here as well is that a broadening of that membrane again, and it sort of folds over this set of lots and lots of little tiny suckers at the, at the distal tip here. So we'll just, we'll look at that quite carefully now, and we'll look at it again carefully after it's fixed as well, because um, it's great to look at it fresh, and sometimes things become clearer once it's been fixed and folded as well. So um, we'll look at it carefully on all of the arms um, that we examined today, uh, and then we'll uh, do some comparing of other things that are known in the same family. So we'll have a look at the other arm four. This is um, four left. Yeah. 
20. Okay, and the, so the hooks on this arm are a bit bigger. The hooks get larger in size from the ventral arms up to the dorsal arms. So you can see they're, um, you can get quite a good look at them here. They are fairly fierce looking and they've got little extra cusps as well. So they've got one big claw and then they've got a, little, a little, couple of little extra claws next to them. That should make them extremely good at catching and holding things. Right, and the suckers are, are quite large and have got pretty good teeth in them as well. All right, we'll do arms three on the left. And here's the other, yeah, here are the remains of the other tentacle. So we're not going to get a look at any fresh tentacle clubs today. Uh, but we do have plenty of beautiful hooks to look at on the arms. Okay, so... Eighty. <laughs> right now, I, as you probably noticed, as we were handling this, we could see that a couple of the sucker rings were coming out of the suckers. So what we've done is, because they were already coming loose, and we know by removing them at that point where they came from, we've collected them, taken them out here so that you can have a look at them. Let me just get the plastic out of the way here. Um, and we've got a student who's working on a project as well um, about ocean acidification and how that might be affecting cephalopods. And he's looking in particular at the hard parts of these animals. So uh, we're going to get the bit of grunge off there for you as well. Um, so we can take these hard parts and we can subject them to some conditions that might sort of simulate 
how the ocean's chemistry might be changing and look at what might happen to the hard parts um, if those changes do occur. So um, through the day, as we see the chance to sample um, some of the rings and suckers like this that might already be coming loose, um, we'll take those away and, and use them a bit for that project. All right, so Tyler, do you have uh, something that you want to, a place you want to keep this? Good, so this is, I'm introducing Tyler Northern from the University of Otago, and he's working on his master's on, uh, on ocean acidification and cephalopods um, and some other aspects of the, the hard part biology. So those have come from the third left arm. All right. I'm just going to feel around a bit in here and see how we're doing with the, the defrosting. It's good the head is loose from the mantle. That means shortly we should be able to turn it over. just want to feel how the eye is doing here as well. Yeah, the eye is nice and defrosted. Okay. You got two already? Yeah. Okay. All right, so now we've come around to one of the dorsal pairs of arms. Aaron's looking at arms two. Uh, yes, two right. Actually, this is on the left. Oh, this is left? Yeah. We've just done all of that backwards. Those are all right and left because the, the head's upside down. <laughs> just swap those on the record. Yeah. There are eight hooks on this one. <laughs> it's definitely arms two. Mm -hmm. um, 120 suckers, uh, and then it gets down to multiple series. Got another ring for you as well, Tyler. That's from two left. <laughs> All right. Here's your second arm on the other side. Nice look here at those trabeculae, those big finger-like trabeculae that fold in over the hooks. And you can see there's muscular supports in the membrane. Very large suckers on this arm as well. The suckers and the hooks get larger as you go toward the dorsal series of arms. And they also get closer to the mouth. So actually the location of the hook series is different on each pair of arms. On the bottom pair of arms, the hooks are actually quite far out near the tips. And as you get further up toward the top, the hook series move further and further in.
two, four, six, eight. Whoa. Four, five, eight. Multiple series in there as well? No. Nope. Okay. Nope, so I think, I think we'll leave the arms one for now until we've got it turned over, but we will measure the length of the arm. So if we could have a uh, tape measure, please. Okay. So starting with arm score left. The arms are in really beautiful condition. All of the arm tips are there, so we'll get nice, complete information on this specimen about the proportions of its body. Uh, that's four left. Let's not twist the tape measure. Ooh. That was fun. That's why you work with your mouth closed. Yeah. Right. Oops, sorry. Okay. You got it. Mm-hmm. We'll do two left while we're on the same side. on the right side as well. <laughs> no more tools in the pocket. <laughs> I think my scissors are already in the vat. All right. So. outside the splash zone, right? Yeah. Yeah, I hope so. One twenty. Hang on. Get 
under. Can we turn it for that? Um, mm, not really. We might have to measure that one later. Okay. All right. Uh, and normally we would take the measure of the mantle length on this specimen as well. That's the standard length that we use to sort of measure the overall size of it. Um, but the mantle is still curled around. So as soon as we can get it laid out, then we can tell what the, the mantle is and we can compare it really um, with the specimen that we had in 2009 in terms of length. So um, I believe the plan was to interview some of the students for the moment. So um, you can go away from us tank side for a bit and we promise not to do anything too exciting. Uh, and then when you come back, we'll do a bit more sampling.
Hello and welcome back. We're here at the National Museum of New Zealand, Te Papa Tongareva, live behind the scenes during an examination of a colossal squid. I'm Veronica Maduna and I'm here as a guest of Te Papa to host this session. And we have a team from the Auckland University of Technology here, squid experts, who are helping with the examination. Now, Kat Bolstad leads the team, but she's at Tankside working on the colossal squid as we speak, but I do have her students here with me. So let me first introduce you all. I'll start here with Heather Braid. We have uh, Aaron Boyd Evans. I got that. You just came out of the tank. You were really hard to extract from, <laughs> from your work. We have Tyler Northern and Jesse Kelly. I want to talk to them about their specific research a little bit later, but we've been getting so many questions that I actually thought we'll kick off this session with trying to answer some of them. Many thanks for sending them in. If we can't answer all of them, which we probably won't, rest assured we will answer them. We'll write a blog and answer all those questions. But let's start with some right now. Let me just. We have, coming from nine-year-old Kahu, how many colossal squid are there in the world? Who wants to take this one? Well, uh, we don't know exactly how many there are in the world, but we do know that they make up a very large part of the diet of sperm whales. Uh, so since they make up such a large part of diet, and si since these whales are so large and eat so many of them, there must be quite a few in the ocean. We just have to find them. <laughs> <laughs> they live in the deep ocean, so there is a lot of them, but we're probably never going to see them down there. Now, the next one comes from Mark McCauley. How did you know how long it would take to defrost for this session? We've actually done some rather large squids before. Uh, and so in 2008, they had done colossal squids, so they had the experience from that. Um, in our own lab, we defrosted three giant squids uh, a few months ago. So we had a rough idea of how long it would take. But it did take more than 24 hours, really. It started yesterday at 9 a.m. So next one from Jan. I hope I pronounced that name right. Jan, thank you for the question. How has the colossal squid adapted to harsh conditions but still maintains a massive size? What have you guys? Um, there seems to be a pattern in animals in the deep sea where they get quite large. The giant squid, the colossal squid, they both live in the deep ocean and they're both quite large. Um, evade all those sperm whales Aaron was talking about. Uh, so it has a number of sort of morphological adaptations like that to keep uh, away from predators and to find prey. Fantastic. Thank you for that. And the last one for right now, but we'll come back to more, from Jake Swanson. How does the colossal squid, oh no, does the colossal squid have an ink sac? How big is it and is it blue-black? It sure does have an ink sac. Um, while we've been working on it, we've already seen that there is some ink that's coming out of the funnel. Um, and it's kind of a blue, black, purpley color. Um, but we don't know how big the ink sac is yet. We haven't uh, been able to take a look at it. Um, Perhaps if we're lucky, we will get to look inside and maybe we'll see the ink sack. Uh, but it definitely does have one, and the ink is very dark. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you for that. Now, could I ask all of you how you got into this? It doesn't seem a straightforward road to become a, a water and fish and such, but uh, I grew up in Canada, far away from any ocean. Um, but then there was this one year on the Discovery Channel where they played a whole bunch of uh, deep sea and squid documentaries, and they were just more interesting than anything else I'd heard of. And so that was just, that was it for me then at that point. Um, I've kind of loved the ocean since a young age, and I've always wanted to do marine biology. Um, and I was kind of thrown into toothology, the study of squid. Um, Toothology is the proper name for squidology? Yeah, sounds like a dentist, but it is in fact for squid. Um, so I was kind of thrown, thrown into squid at the start of this year um, when my supervisor told me um, that she had a project on squid, and ever since then I've loved it. Yeah, I'm really enjoying it. Now, you were really hard to extract from the tank, so I'm, I, I get that you are a squid fan, but how did you get into it? Um, I've loved squid since a very young age, since maybe like four or five. Um, but like Jesse, it was watching TV documentaries and getting to see all of those fascinating scientists as they go out on vessels and, and go in submarines. And I kind of looked and went, yeah, that's what I want to do with my life. Um, and I know that there's a lot of kids at that age go, oh, yeah, I want to study fish when I grow up. And, and then they don't. Um, but I never quite grew out of that. That's still something that I really love doing. Hold on to it. <laughs> For me, like Jesse, I also grew up landlocked, um, so it's kind of weird to end up studying the ocean. Uh, but when I was in the last year of high school, trying to figure out what to do with my life, I read an article about Steve O'Shea, the giant squid hunter, and I knew that's what I was going to do. 
So you did become a squid hunter. Now, today, obviously, is a special day for all of you, but it's not every day that you get to work on a specimen like this. What do you do when you're a normal day in the lab? I'll start this way around again. Well, for me, I work on a lot of genetics, so a normal day would include DNA extractions and PCR, um, but also reading a lot of papers and doing a lot of typing. Yeah, scientists, unfortunately, most of the media attention is focused on really cool stuff like this, but we do spend a lot of time sitting at a desk at our computer answering emails and writing stuff out and editing documents. Um, so when we do get to be in a lab, especially working on something as fantastic as a colossal squid, we really love it. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a field trip of some kind. <laughs> yeah, I'll, um, I'll back that up. We definitely do a lot of writing. Um, we, get, we get to do quite a bit of measuring of things as well, um, which is quite interesting. Um, and the most exciting part is, for me anyway, cutting things up and taking parts of squid out and getting to see what they look like on the inside. But sadly, that's not all the time. Uh, yeah, I think it's been covered quite well already. But yeah, <laughs> a lot of time at the desk and then a lot of time measuring and counting. <laughs> now, this bit about cutting up squid as not for everybody, I guess you've had an experience there. Uh, yeah, so squid research is really fun, but it's also pretty disgusting. Um, the first time I was going to work on squid stomach contents, I'd been waiting years for it. Finally got samples, opened them in the lab, and no one could stand to be in a room with me. It was quite awful. We can still stand to be in the room with you, but after a few hours of this, you might, you might get that way too. It might be a bit smelly, yeah. <laughs> now, what do you guys do if you've had enough of squid? Are you all divers? Do you spend a lot of time in the ocean, regardless of whether it's for work or for fun? Time. Yeah, I spend quite a lot of um, my time snorkeling around in, um, down Dunedin uh, in the cold waters. Um, <laughs> I need a big wetsuit for that. Um, and yeah, spend a lot of time kind of in or on the ocean as much as I can. Yeah, uh, I like to snorkel and dive as well. Unfortunately, it's not in part of uh, any of my research, but it's uh, a lot of fun and I enjoy it, so yeah. I do do a bit of diving, um, but uh, I'm usually pretty close to the ocean. That's kind of where I like to spend my downtime, um, even if it's just sitting on the beach and watching the waves. I don't dive, which is odd for a marine biologist, um, but I have been on a boat collecting samples, and I think that would be better. You're probably from this group. You're probably the one who spends most time actually in sort of analyzing samples. Genetics means that you don't necessarily need to see the, the animal. Well, I'm actually an integrative taxonomist, partly. So I would do morphology, like sit in the lab with Aaron and count and measure stuff, and then take my samples back to the lab and do DNA work on them. So I do both. Now, we've got lots of schools watching this and tuning in. Given your getting into science, if you had to say something or give some advice to high school students watching now, what would you say? I'll, um, how about Aaron? <laughs> uh, well, to be honest, it's just one of those follow your dreams moments. When I was back being, when I was a young kid, I never thought that I would actually get to come and do something like this. I mean, I get to look at a colossal squid. That's a dream that most kids have at some point in time. Um, so just keep at it. Um, yeah, it's, it's definitely worth all of the effort that you have to put in. Um, and if it's something that you're really passionate about, go for it. Well, if they're looking for a place to study squid, we clearly have a lab for that, so follow your dreams. In fact, we might as well mention, because New Zealand is in fact a hotspot for squid. Yeah, I think that um, our current statistic is we have about 90 different species of squid here, uh, which is the highest uh, squid demographic in the world. Uh, so if you are interested in studying squid, this is the place to be. <laughs> what about you? What would you tell a high school student? Um, yeah, just... Keep going, keep working hard, um, and don't really don't give up. I know there's sometimes when you know, might be writing a big lab report and you're thinking, oh, this is this is too hard. I just want to you know give up and go work at Macca's. But I'd say yeah, really stick at it. Uh, yeah, stick with it, and uh, it might not seem like there's a ton of opportunity, but I find I have found personally the more you know and the more you get into it, the more options there actually are, and so it kind of might become easier in that sense. But you have to you have to stick it out and find them for sure. Fantastic. Thank you all. And we'll bring them back in here to talk more specifically about their research interests and we'll also bring more questions back in a minute. But let's go back tank side and you'll get back into the tank. Are uh, we getting back in? Yeah. <laughs> Hi. 
We don't know. We haven't seen the underside of the head yet. So, we, but we definitely have got one one very beautiful one right here. Sorry. We're not entirely sure yet. Um, we may we may take them out. Um, it depends a little bit on what's on the other side. Come back. Thank you. We'll, um, we'll measure the eye again. Um, it's in in. Well, it's more defrosted now. Um, and probably the lens and things as well. And I think I might. Oops, maybe I'll see if I can get the beak out at this point, and we'll do that too. Okay. Oh, look at it in the. It looks, the water looks so black. I know. So, but I don't. I don't want to flip it before we get a good look at that eye because I don't want to rupture that as it goes over. So, I'm thinking that what we might do is measure the eye, probably take the beak out at this point, and talk about that, and have a quick chat to them about taking the eye out, and then once we've done that, we'll flip it. Okay. Hop in. Hmm. Hop in. Um, I'm just waiting to hear that they're they're back over here. Are we on here? Are we on here? All right. Okay. All right. All right, welcome back to the tank side of the colossal squid. Uh, in love, swimming in some lovely murky water here. Water was actually a very beautiful pale blue color before we put the squid in yesterday, and uh, now it looks like this. <laughs> now, Kat, just before you get into the next sampling mm -hmm. session, can I give you some questions? We've been getting so many questions Absolutely. from everybody throughout the country, so if we could perhaps try and answer some. From Ramati Beach, how long are the tentacles? You've just been measuring in the first session. Do you know how long the tentacles are? Well, we can tell you how long some of the arms are. So there's a difference between the arms and the tentacles. Um, the squid has got eight arms, uh, and they surround the beak, and those arms have got hooks and, and suckers all the way down to the ends. And then there are two longer tentacles, um, which have got mostly hooks and suckers right at the very ends of them. So the, the tips of those tentacles um, are not present on this specimen. I think the captain mentioned that some, some fish had, been, had come in that had bits of squid in them. So it may be that we had a squid eating a fish with the fish eating a squid situation at the same time. <laughs> um, so they're not on this specimen, but what we're going to get um, an example of them from the collections to show you what the swiveling hooks looks like. So we know the arms on this specimen are just over a meter long, and the tentacles probably would have been about two and a half meters, but they're not complete. So significantly longer than yes. what you'd expect. Mm -hmm. Now, from Joachim, why are squids so hard to find and study? 
Uh, well, not all squid are hard to find and study. There are some that occur in sort of coastal and shallower waters. I love that I'm still wearing these and gesturing with my big arm gloves. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but the ones that live in the deep sea are very difficult because the, the deep sea is a huge place. Um, it makes up something like 75% of the living space on this planet. And scattered throughout it are very interesting animals. But of course, your chances of encountering any one thing when you go looking are very slim. And it's thousands of meters down. The technology needed um, is very specialized and very expensive. So the, the difficulty in studying them is getting to where they are. And then, of course, they can see very well. So they see you coming and they go away. Thank you for that. Now, last one for now. Edensdale Primary School, how does it sting its prey, and do they use camouflage? Ah, two very good questions. So um, I'll, we'll do the camouflage one first. Um, if it's like other members of the family, its camouflage lies in the fact that it can be mostly transparent if it wants to. Um, members of this family can go from red to clear in a split second, basically. So they change how they look entirely. So it's possible the colossal squid can do that. Um, if not, if it sort of keeps this deep red color, down where it lives, uh, the, the, one of the colors that disappears first is actually reddish brown. So the, the blue light that filters down the deepest is absorbed by the color of the colossal squid. So although it looks reddish purple to us, it would look black down the depths. So that would be its camouflage. Um, uh, as far as um, contacting its prey goes, we think most likely it makes first contact with those long tentacles with the swiveling hooks, and then it would bring it in and, and restrain the prey within the arms, within the suckers and hooks while it eats it. Great. Thank you, Kate. Now, tell me, you're just about to start the next sampling session. Mm. What's going to be the focus of that? Well, we're going to do a couple of things. Um, because the eye is sort of right up where we can have a good look at it, we're going to measure it and have a, a good close look at it where it is in place. Um, and then we're going to also have a look at the mouth. So we're just going to sort of focus on the head region right now um, and hopefully show people some, some of the exciting things about the structures in this part of the squid. The most exciting thing about a colossal squid in its eyes is that it's huge. It is enormous. I mean, you can see sitting there that it's, it's massive. <laughs> Does it work like our eyes? Does it have a lens? Yes, it does. It's got a lens which is still in there, um, and we'll show that to you in just a minute. So the lens of a, of a cephalopod eye is actually in two halves. So our lens is solid, but the lens here is a sphere formed by two hemispheres that stick together. Um, and the lens is quite a good size, um, and like our eye, the light passes through the lens and is caught by the retina at the back and processed. Fantastic. Thank you, Kate. I'll let right. you get on with it. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Right, shall we measure the eye? Sure. All right, so we'll, we'll float the head up to the surface again a bit here. Um, we did have a bit of a look at the eye earlier, but it's because it was frozen, it was distorted a little bit. But now it's, it's sort of in a more sensible round shape. And I would say we want to measure from about there to there. Okay. The aperture is a little bit off-center, but we know that the colossal squid's eyes are pointed slightly toward the arms, so a little bit anteriorly. So this, this aperture means that the squid is sort of looking at kind of a 45-degree angle out towards its arms and tentacles, generally. So the eye diameter will go here to here and across sort of the, the depth as well. Right. From there, you think? That's about right. Yeah. So I'm going to say, what, 34, 35? Uh, that depends if it's, if it's there, it's 38. Well, I think it's probably sitting inside the sleeve a little okay. bit here, so conservatively I'd so say 35. 35. Yeah. Okay, good. Okay, so the, the one that we measured on the previous specimen was about 27 centimeters, and this one is looking like, at least in at least one dimension, it's about 35 centimeters, so a very, very big eye. And again, probably about 35. All right, so we're going to say the diameter on this is about 35 centimeters, which is significantly larger than the last one. It is very difficultly, difficult to measure this in situ because we can't see exactly where the eye is, um, where the margins of the eye are. So um, we'll be having a chat to, um, to the staff here and see sort of what samples they're okay with us taking from the eye. Obviously, we'd like to know more about the vision. Um, and in the meantime, we'll bring this up again and we'll show you the lens because the lens is still in there. So if we pull, actually, can I have a, 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 one of the smaller gloves? Sorry, try not to fling too much goo on you. Thanks. Yeah, so um, cephalopods are known for having extremely good vision. Um, 
There's some mysteries about it. It seems like most cephalopods are completely colorblind, uh, including octopuses, which are masters of color camouflage. So we're not really sure how how that's possible. Um, but we know that the eye... Oh, all right, and then we've got half the eye lens. <laughs> Right, so the, the eye lens does deteriorate quite quickly. It's in layers, and the layers start to peel off as it defrosts. So we've got half of, the, half of that hemisphere. I was talking about the fact that it forms a full sphere, so that's half of it, and the other half is still in place. And it's you know nice and shiny and pearly, a bit like a human eye lens. All right, so that sits naturally in the middle of an iris, just like a, like a human iris, uh, and filters light through to the retina at the back of the eye. I just want to... See, it's still a bit frozen in there. All right. So the lens, um, probably a few of the layers have come off of it already as it's been sitting in solution. So the original size of the lens would probably have been maybe a centimeter larger on each side. All right, and something else you can see, sort of see peeking out of the aperture here is this is a light organ on the surface of the eye. So this is the ventral side of the animal. All of the squids in this particular family have got light organs on the eyes. Um, and it's thought that their main function is to sort of help hide the shadow of the eyes from below. So if these animals are completely transparent most of the time, one of the things in the body that cannot be made transparent is the eyes. So if you're swimming underneath a glass squid and looking up, you don't see much of a silhouette, but you can see that there are two very big dark eyes there, unless they've got some way of masking them. And so they've got these light organs underneath that light up, and they sort of match the same intensity of light coming down from the surface. Uh, and they use that to hide the shadow of their eyes, basically. So the, um, the colossal squid has got smaller uh, light organs or photophores than some others, but still very clearly visible. There's one, one here that we should probably measure. Set the lens just there for now. Can I just have a, um, no, just a, a tape measure? I've got the tape measure. You've got a tape measure? All right, so we've got one, the smaller photophore is here, and then the outer one is hidden underneath the skin here, and it makes a big crescent around the bottom part of the eye. So here, this white strip that we're looking at, that is the, the smaller of the two light organs on the, on the surface of the eye. And that's about four and a half centimeters long. All right, now something else that we're doing today as we get the chance is we're taking some swabs to see if we can look at uh, the bacteria that are may or may not be living anywhere associated with some of the squid's body parts. So um, I'm actually going to take a little bacterial swab inside the eye and we'll look at that later and see what we can find out. That was inside, and I'll do another one as well. Thank you. Make sure you change the label. There, lots of nice colorful stuff from in there. Hmm? Both inside the eye. So here you can see part of the, that other much larger light organ. This is the, that white strip here. And that one runs sort of all the way down around the inside here. And they've got a sort of an interesting strategy here. Instead of having two very large light organs, they've got two small ones, but a lot of shiny reflector stuff pointed toward each other. So they make a mirror and they reflect the extra light sort of the way you'd have a reflective covering behind a light bulb that increases the amount of light put out and helps mask the, the shadow of the eye without having to have two really energy expensive uh, light organs sitting there. Well, I'm just gonna feel around inside here a little bit. 
see, not lose the lens. <laughs> Is there and the other half of the lens? Okay. Okay. Do you want the lens back? Um, I think. Yeah, I think we'll. Tyler's right behind you. One. Yeah. I'll just show you the the inside of the lens while we're here as well. So I was talking about the growth rings that you can see inside the, the hard parts. And the lens is one of the body parts that has hard parts with growth rings. And you can see very clearly there sort of a little shiny nucleus and then extra growth rings coming out from outside it. We're going to put that back in the freezer now before any more of it comes apart. Thanks. All right, so we'll leave the eye for right now. Let me just check how we're doing on time. All right, so um, we're going to sort of stick within the head region and uh, we'll leave the eye for right now, but I think the next thing we'll have a look at is the mouth of the squid, and this is always quite exciting. I'm going to need a long glove for this and a short glove, I suspect. Um, yeah, let me just see. No, I think I can probably get it out just from here, but I do need... Can I grab another nitrile glove, please? All right, so we're going to go and have a look at the mouth of the squid, which is a, a set of two beaks, um, an upper beak and a lower beak, like a bird's beak, and it sits in the middle of the arm crown. So the, uh, the arms and tentacles form a ring around the squid's mouth. So if you're thinking about sort of forwards and backwards on a squid, it's a little bit difficult to, uh, to draw parallels between um, mammals, for example. You sort of think the front end is where the food goes in and the back end is where the food comes out later. And with a squid, the food goes in the mouth, goes all the way up to the end, gets digested, turns around in a big U, and then comes back out the funnel, which is sort of at the same end. So we sort of think of this as being the front end of the squid because the mouth is there, but front and back are, are a little bit different in this group of animals. So in the center of the arms, we have a bulb of muscle that holds the squid's beaks. And what I'm doing right now is just sort of feeling around to get a, a sense of how big the bulb of muscle is going to be and what we're going to need to do to get it out of there to show you the beaks. So that's pretty massive and I think I'm just going to see how much of it I can get in behind and how frozen the head is still. I think I'm going to need a scalpel. Okay. Yeah. And Heather, if I could have another set of swabs, I'll do some swabs around the mouth as well. So once again, one of the places on the squid we think we might possibly find some interesting bacteria would be in and around the mouth, see if it's getting any assistance in getting things digested from any nice bugs. Mmm. Delicious. Just wind it up like a bit of spaghetti, oh, and lose it. Quick. There we go, no problem. Here, I'll give you another one. All right. So 
Sorry, not as gross that time. I got all the gross stuff up the first time. Did you have? Thanks. Thanks. All right. muscle that I'm trying to pull out here is about the size of my two fists together. Is as you can imagine fairly deeply seated in the head because it needs to be in order to manage crunching up all of those big fish and other things that the squid may eat. get right in behind it because normally it's always dangerous to say it comes out in a nice clean lump of muscle. Okay, I can feel some ice behind it. Huge. The buccal bulb is absolutely enormous. And really in there. Really, really stuck in there. Yeah. Pretty well frozen as well. Yeah. As I let my fingers thaw for a moment, if we pull this up for a second, you can get possibly a first glimpse of the beak here, which is this one of the hard parts I can use to lever the squid up out of the tank with. Actually, I know it's on the wrong side for most of you, <clears throat> but we will get it turned around and you can have a look at it in just a minute here. So that beak is uh, the squid's main method of making its food small enough to actually be swallowed. The squid has got um, a very small esophagus, a little bit larger than maybe the diameter of your thumb, and everything that it eats has got to pass through that tube. And the tube goes through the middle of the brain, which is shaped like a donut inside the head. So the, the beak is very, very important for the squid to actually get the food down to a small enough size to safely pass through the middle of its very strange brain uh, and get safely down to the other end where it gets digested. Anyone else really keen to have a go? <laughs> I'm pretty, pretty close to the back of it now, I think. 
is very icy. All right, what we might do is set up, we've got a little pump running in the tank here, and we'll set up some fresh water to run straight in there, which will help defrost the back. I've got it free most of the way around, um, but it does need to get some of the, the ice at the back. Is the pump on at the moment? Great. So we need to get um, some of the ice right at the very back of the mouth defrosted before we can actually get the beak out. So I'm going to take a little bit of fresh water there and put it right in toward the back of the mouth. And we'll just leave that for a bit and let it defrost. Yeah, that's right, right in where we want it. All right. Um, I think it's okay, actually. I'm just just running water in. Yeah, sure. Behind the beak. I imagine they're probably gonna wanna. Um, uh, yeah. It's not too far off. I'll just work work it around a bit. Um, let's see if we can get it to let go. Welcome back to the Science Life session. We're here live behind the scenes at Te Papa Tongareva during an examination of a very rare specimen of colossal squid. And with me is one of the students who've come from the Auckland University of Technology, Aaron Boyd Evans. Aaron, I do have a few questions for you first before we talk about your own specific research. This one I thought you'd be the best to answer. Okay. From Dismayed, what does the colossal squid smell like? Well, I think I'm a bit biased um, because I'm fairly used to these smells. Um, this one faintly smells like fish market. If you go to the fish market, it's really usually quite strong. This one's not that strong yet. Um, it's just been freshly thawed, so it hasn't started smelling really bad. Give it another few hours, and it'll probably smell a lot worse. Okay, <laughs> yeah, just me, I can reassure you, Aaron does not smell bad yet, and he's been in the, in the tank with it. <laughs> the next one, Sarah Morgan asks, why does the skin look peely? Is that freezer damage? Yeah, it is. Um, well, partially. When, when squid are caught, they have very delicate skin on the outside of their tissue. So even when they're caught, it still starts to peel. Um, but then we freeze it, and then we have to dethaw it, and it starts to peel a bit further. Uh, so there's no real good way to uh, keep the skin on the animal. However, that being said, the skin on this animal is actually in really good condition. It's starting to peel, but there's still a lot of it, and it's that gorgeous red color, and we're really impressed with the amount of skin that's on this creature. Great, so you'll still be able to work with that. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Let's do one more from Robert Rain Cook. Not sure if I'm pronouncing, pronouncing the names right, but it looks like Rain Cook. How intelligent is the colossal squid? Well... Not so. <laughs> probably not that smart. Um, octopus and cuttlefish, which are uh, cousins of the, the squid, um, are quite intelligent. We know that they're really intelligent. Squid, probably not so intelligent. They don't have very big brains, um, and the amount of uh, 
intelligent behavior that we see in octopuses, we don't see that in squid. Uh, so fast, powerful, very muscular, not that bright. <laughs> thanks, Aaron, and thanks for your questions. Keep them coming in. We'll answer them as we go, as much as we go, as much as we can. But if we can't answer them all, which we won't, we'll um, answer them later in a blog format. Now, Aaron, you're doing your PhD doctoral thesis on this particular group of squid, the glass squid that the colossal belongs to. Can you tell me about them? Why are they glass squids? Well, as we've mentioned already a bit, um, most of the squid, when they get to this adult form, are still transparent, um, and that's not really seen in any other squid. Um, the colossal squid, we haven't really seen it in the wild, so we don't know if it's transparent when it gets to an adult form. Um, we do see it in this red coloration, um, and other cratchid squid can turn from clear to red quite quickly. Um, but that's where they get their name from, from that transparent tissue that is very rarely seen. So given that you don't get to see a colossal squid every day, how can you study that group? Do you look mostly at other parts of that or members of that family? Yeah, I spend a lot of time looking at cousins of the colossal squid. There's a lot of much smaller ones that you can easily put into a jar and stick it on a shelf. Um, we do have parts of the colossal squid, though, which can be very helpful. We store the beak, we store tentacle clubs, uh, we store, store skin samples, uh, and I get to look at those uh, in between having gigantic specimens, uh, and uh, those kind of help me to answer some of the questions that we have about them. Now, one thing you promised you would demonstrate for us today is the way they move. It's called the cockatoo position. The cockatoo position, yes. So when you think of, of the cockatoo bird, they've got that giant crest on their head. Um, and that's actually kind of seen in this family of squid. Most squid, when they're hunting and they see their prey, that'll be my prey over there, they, have, they look right at it, and their arms are out in front of them like this. Um, however, the cratchit squid take their arms and raise them above their head, and then they actually take their eyes, and they can swivel them slightly forward so that they can get a better look at their prey. Uh, so the cockatoo position is, is seen in several different members of this family, and it's just where they swim along with their arms above their head, um, and that's how they kind of make room for their big eyes to spot prey around them. So do you think it is because of that, so that they can actually move their eyes, which probably gives them quite a good almost 360 vision? Oh, I wouldn't say 360, um, but it does uh, help them to see things that are directly in front of them. Um, and not all of the cratchits can do this. There is some eye movement in most of them, um, but there are some, like there's a species called Taonius, um, which can actually swivel its eyes all the way around in front of it. And it's, we've seen videos of it doing this, and it's kind of creepy, actually. Um, but it does definitely give them a better idea of what is around them, so that they aren't just looking out straight at the sides all the time. You've just, during the last sampling session, you've looked at the eye of this particular specimen of the colossal squid. So do you expect it to be able to do this movement of its eyes, and do you expect it to be doing the cockatoo position? That is one of the questions that we would love to be able to answer. Um, if we see it in the wild, we might be able to answer that. There is some, some ability for it to be able to shift its eyes. It probably can't move them all the way in front of it. It's got a very big body, and it's got very big eyes, and to move those would require a lot of effort. Um, but it is possible that it puts its arms above its head and that it can move its eyes a little bit to try and get a better vantage point. Sure, that's possible. Great. Thank you, Aaron. I'll let you go back to the tank now. Thank you very much. Lion King moment here. It's a squid.
Right, so as you can imagine, the squid was not all that keen to part with this enormous bulb of muscle, which is what it uses to power the very large beaks. Uh, these are by far the largest squid beaks. And we know from looking at the beaks of previous specimens and beaks found in sperm whale stomachs that colossal squid can get slightly larger than the colossal squid we've seen so far. So we won't know for sure until we measure this one how it measures up against the very largest ones. Um, but that is quite clearly an enormous squid beak. It's a lovely piece of goo hanging off it here. So things that we'd like to know about the squid that we can tell from the beak include, we'll measure sort of the standard measurement of the beak, which is the length of this cutting edge here. This is called the lower rostral edge. So this is actually the lower beak. Naturally, it sits like this. The upper beak fits inside the lower beak. And when it, it's cutting, it's food up, it's chop, it's chewing like this, basically. So we'll want to know exactly how long that lower rostrum is. Um, we are going to have a look at the radula, which is a sort of a rasped tongue inside that the, the squid uses to chop the food down into even smaller pieces and sort of shunt it down the esophagus. And I mentioned before that the esophagus is not very big. This is it hanging off the back of the beak here with a nice little bit of ice inside it. And that's, that's it. That's the size of the tube that passes all of the colossal squid's food down to its stomach. So it's got to use this massive beak to cut up things like possibly up to two or three meter Patagonian toothfish down into sizes small enough that they'll fit through that too. Can you just turn the beak on this side please? Sure. Thank you. Mm-hmm. What is that beak capable of cutting through? Patagonian toothfish. Like I mean, much well, I don't imagine it munches through bone that that much. I mean, it's not cutting through deep sea cables or anything. Um, but it's very powerful. I mean, that's that's a lot of muscle. Um, the beak is very hard. Anyone who would like to poke at the beak and then touch their nice camera equipment is welcome. Um, so it's quite a sharp edge and a very hard edge as well. So it's got a lot of muscle and a lot of cutting strength. So and now I don't know. See if you can see in there is the radula. So there's a sort of a, a tongue in there that's got a row of seven sharp teeth across. And it's, it's rasped a bit like a cat's tongue. Um, and we'll take that out as well. But just so you can see what it sort of naturally looks like. So this is the parts of the squid's mouth. It's got uh, the lower beak that surrounds the upper beak when it sort of bites like this. And inside, just tilt it there is the radula, and it's that brown or sort of amber-colored structure that you can see with those teeth across. Yeah, I will do. Right, so one of the really nice things about taking the beak out of a specimen when it's been frozen and thawed um, is that you can use the muscle here, which is not used for a lot of systematic purposes, um, for a lot of samples for chemical analysis. So this is um, very strong muscle tissue and should be able to be used for a lot of the different chemical analyses that we'd like to use. So um, we're going to take some pieces of it and uh, fix it in a couple of different ways. We're going to refreeze some. We're going to put some in alcohol. Um, and then we'll look at taking the beaks actually out of the surrounding musculature as well. Heather, are you ready for some tissue samples? Great. Uh, 
Um, probably a bag. Like, yeah, lar the larger bag that you've got there. Yep. We'll just take off this outer membrane here and then I'll show you another nice view of the beaks in the muscle before they come out. Do you want to sort of help peel the muscle back there? Pull it around toward you. Yeah, I think we can just, we'll freeze that. Just freeze the whole membrane. Well, freeze, freeze the whole membrane. And then I'll take, we'll take some samples of the, the muscles here as well. Hmm? Yep. Mm -hmm. So I can get a, probably a slightly better look at the way the beak works now. Calipers over there. You take the um, the rostral length as well. Okay, so we need to measure from that corner up to the tip, and you'll probably want the yeah the back side of the calipers for that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But you probably need to flip it over. Upside down. Right. Like that and get in there. So we've got um, the lower rostral length, which is the length of the lower biting edge here, is about 41 millimeters. And uh, that's almost exactly the same size as the one that we examined in 2008, which is still slightly smaller than the very largest known colossal squid beaks. So it is likely that the colossal squid can still get a bit larger than what we've got sitting here in the tank. The, um, the largest known are sort of in the mid-40s. So the beak is still, the muscle for the beak is still a little bit frozen inside, so I think we're going to put that aside. Do you want to have a closer look at the mouth? That is. Just fits in here beautifully, doesn't it? Yep, just, yep, plenty of, plenty of room so for just, two so fish. So it just munches away and 
Yep, Doesn't that's really right. take big bites, it just nibbles. And no, it's probably not a very nice way to go, mm. really. I mean, squid are really good at catching things and holding on to them, yep. but they don't kill them all that quickly, so I have to say, eating, being eaten by a squid is not one of my preferred nice, no. ways to think about exiting this world, no. Mm. Yeah. Some All right. Sure. Marvelous. That's it. And looking as well. That's it. Cool. Thank you. And that's one like this. I'm just bring this feet really close like that. And off to you guys. Nice. I think we're just going to sit in a tray to defrost a little bit. That tray would be perfect. All right. Time for some fresh gloves. Oh yeah. Just gonna wash my hands for a minute. Lift up the squid, no problem. <laughs> I'll just lift up the moving squid. Everyone look this way, right here. And look naturally. I'm so sorry, squid. I'm sure there's no gigantic finger lifting it. Or I tried to lift it. I'm so sorry. You're so beautiful. Hello and welcome back again. We're here at the Science Live Session at Te Papa Tongareva. And if you've just joined us, we are live behind the scenes during an examination of a colossal squid. Much of that action is happening next door, but briefly we're going to distract you from that and look at another squid. We've got a team from the Auckland University of Technology here, squid experts, and with me now is Jesse Kelly. Now, Jesse, you have a particular interest in squid anatomy, mm -hmm. and you brought a much smaller squid here. <laughs> I feel almost sorry about bringing people <laughs> away from the colossal squid, but we're looking at an arrow squid here. Tell me a bit about it. Uh, so these are arrow squid. Uh, Nototodaris is the genus name. There's two species here in New Zealand, one up in the North Island and then a different species off the South Island. And uh, the arrow squid is the main sort of market squid that you'll find in the fish shop. Um, calamari rings are made out of these squid here, so they're the most familiar to most New Zealanders. So this is a commercial species, we're fishing for it and that's what we eat? Yeah, absolutely. 
So why do you want to look at this one in comparison to the colossal squid? Are they the same family? They're not really that related, are they? No, no, they're quite, um, I believe they're, uh, they're in different families. And so uh, when you look at the bodies of uh, these squid, sort of the differences between them, you can sort of uh, get an estimate on how things are related to each other. And so, uh, and not just in the proportion, these are obviously much smaller than the colossal that we have out in the other room, uh, but the actual structures themselves, uh, these ones don't have hooks, which I believe have been given a fair bit of attention on the colossal squid. So there are a number of differences like that that give us clues to not only how they're related, but uh, how they live out in the ocean. Does this one have a beak? Because if you've been watching, you would have just seen that huge beak from the colossal squid. Do you expect one in, in the arrow squid? Yeah, they will both have, uh, uh, just like out there, they have a lower and upper beak inside uh, the arms there. But what uh, is really unique and helpful about squid beaks is that they're different between species so that we can tell some species apart just based on the beak alone. So let's... Let's get on with this one. If you could just talk us through. Okay, so this is the top of a squid and this is the bottom of the squid. Uh, and so you're looking at uh, the arms are out here and then we have two sets of long feeding tentacles, fins at the back. We're just gonna have a quick look inside, which we haven't done with the colossal squid yet out in the big tank, but they will be getting to that, I'm sure, in the next hour or so. So you're just cutting through the mantle? Yeah, so this is the mantle, the main body of the squid, which is used uh, commercially for calamari rings. And so inside the squid, we can see on each side these two large gills. Squid are quite active, much like fish, so they bring in fresh water, uh, they pass it over their gills and extract the oxygen, and then they expel it out the front here through the funnel. And uh, this is both the way they breathe, but also lets them uh, move. They can have, they can uh, swim with their fins, and they can also use this form of jet propulsion to escape uh, a predator quite quickly. So that's really when they need to move even faster, exactly. either escape or chase something. Yes, they can also, uh, squid can swim in sort of any direction. Backwards is the most aerodynamic, but they can also use the jet propulsion if they need it to lunge forward at something. Uh, the two feeding tentacles are primarily what they use to feed, and they're quite elastic, so they can uh, cinch them together and then shoot them forward out from the arms to latch onto their prey with these larger suckers here, are great for capturing prey, and then they pull it back into the arm crown here with all of these arms covered in suckers, which they use to manipulate the prey uh, down into the center here, which is where... Oh, yes, I can see the beak there. Yeah. And on little squid like that, you're actually able to just pop it out. We had um, a little more difficulty with the colossal squid. And so these are the two beaks. The upper beak sits inside the lower beak, and they're much like a parrot. They use it to chop up the food that gets passed to them by the arms before it passes further back into the stomach area for digestion because, as Kat mentioned outside, the uh, esophagus travels through the brain, and so the food that's ingested has to be quite small in order to not cause any significant damage. <laughs> so this is something that all squids do. They have this donut-shaped brain with a hole in the middle and the throat goes right through it? Yes, as far as we know, that's sort of the, the standard uh, model of squid for some reason. <laughs> I guess you've got no explanation why that would yeah, be. I, 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 don't, I think it had to do with maybe um, squid and octopus are quite intelligent, so they've expanded their brain uh, in comparison to other mollusks like snails or slugs, and so it might have kind of had to do with uh, the way in which they were able to expand it was in this one way which happened to kind of be inconvenient down the road, but no one knew that at the beginning, so... <laughs> Now, you mentioned before that the shape of the beak is one of the things that can be different between different squids. So is that different to what we saw in the colossal squid? Yeah, it's really... Yeah. It's most helpful, this one, <laughs> when you have them uh, side by side to really see the difference because it can be quite tricky otherwise. Um, but So some of them will have... Uh, a large groove along the side of the wall here. This one is quite different from the squid that I study. My squid have a much taller beak and a much, uh, this end out here is much shorter, but it, it's, it's a relative comparison. You have to kind of have two to 
tell the difference really. Um, but these you can recover from predator stomachs. When uh, sperm whales beach themselves, uh, people can extract their stomachs and determine what they've been eating. And that's how we know uh, sperm whales in the Antarctic eat so many colossal squid is because these things remain in their stomach and we can actually learn quite a bit about them. So they are indigestible really? Yeah, yeah, they're quite tough actually. They're uh, made out of something similar to uh, fingernail, a very hard protein. So what else is of interest in this one, J.A.? Um, arrow squid here in New Zealand um, are reasonably tricky to tell the differences apart. I believe it's based only on... Uh, in males, they have a, a modified arm, which they use in reproduction. Uh, and so I think that is the main difference for telling the two. So uh, Heather, who does a little bit of work with arrow squid, that's a very important thing that she's always checking because that's how you tell the two species apart if you don't know where they've been captured, uh, which is sometimes tricky to determine. So uh, the arm suckers um, here on the bottom arms are very useful. Uh, and then other than that, uh, they belong to a family of squid that's uh, got a very, very characteristic um, funnel locking cartilage. It's a piece of cartilage, much like an, an ear, tough and shaped like an ear actually, which the squid uses to hold the funnel attached to the, mu the mantle. And this they use to lock the mantle down to expel the water when they're trying to jet propulse. Uh, and only this family of squid has this, it's considered to be T-shaped. I'm not sure how well it shows up on camera, but it's a T-shaped funnel cartilage. So that's something when you're dealing with this kind of squid that it's the first thing you often check to make sure you're dealing with the squid that you think you're dealing with. I'm just looking at its eyes. They are, again, like with the colossal squid, relatively large, huge even compared to the size of the yes. whole animal. Does that apply across all squids? Um, generally speaking, yes. Yeah, squid are very visually oriented. They're very active. They're uh, high-end predators, but they primarily base themselves on vision in terms of actually seeing their prey and capturing it in that way. So lots, uh, very often when you're talking to people about squid, one of the first things they point out is how big the eyes are because they are quite large compared to the rest of the body. Would that apply to the colossal squid itself too because it lives in the dark? You'd still be using vision mostly? It becomes trickier when you talk about things in the deep ocean like that. Uh, but as far as we can tell, um, it, it does seem to be true because they do have these very large eyes. They haven't lost them. They have very large eyes, and Kat was pointing out those photophores, those organs that produce light. They use those to hide the eyes. So the eyes are large, and they actually could maybe interfere with the squid's ability to escape predators, but they're so important that they try and hide them. So they must be using them for... Uh, to avoid predators or probably to capture prey. Thank you very much for that, Jesse. Now, shall we go back to the tank and look yes, some please. more at the colossal squid? You really want to go? <laughs> yeah, okay, absolutely. thank you.
nice photo for. That's a gorgeous photo. Yeah, it's getting there. It's got some free ice crystals floating around yeah. in there. And some yeah. it's quite firmly attached around the back, actually. Hmm. Ah. <laughs> I'm guessing you want to cut that out before we straighten it. I want that out, and then we'll flip it. Hello, and we're back in here again with another student of the team that's led by Kat um, Bolstad. She's out with the Colossal Squid, still doing the examination, but I have here Heather Braid. Thanks for joining us, Heather. Now, your focus is on squid genetics, so you've been taking samples already? Yeah, we've been taking muscle tissue samples um, because that way we can actually see uh, the species ID. So we've noticed a few really weird morphological features, especially on the arms. Kat was showing multiple series of suckers. Uh, and so I'd like to compare that sequence to ones that are already available to just make sure that it really is a colossal squid. So available from another colossal squid. Yeah. Are you suggesting that this is not a colossal squid? <laughs> Most likely it is a colossal squid, and it just happens that it's a weird morphological thing. Um, but 
They've noticed that in giant squid. So in giant squid, at one point, they thought there might be up to 20 different species. Recently, genetics have revealed it's all one. There's just a lot of morphological variation. So it's most likely that it's just a lot of morphological variation that we see in colossal squid, but it's always good to double-check uh, morphology with genetics. So this could actually be one of the big findings from today. If it does turn out to be a colossal squid, then at least we know that they do vary in the way the suckers line up on the, on the arms? Well, it would be really good to just confirm the ID, just to make sure, because... It would be very interesting if it happens that sometimes the suckers are just very different from other squids. So you took that sample from a mussel. Is that the best tissue for that? Um, for doing species ID, we actually use a mitochondrial gene. So there's two different... Um, essentially places for DNA in the cell. There's the nucleus with nuclear DNA and the mitochondria, um, and those are the powerhouse of the cell, and they have their own circular genome. And there tend to be much more mitochondria in muscle tissue because it needs to work more. Uh, and so then we'd have a lot of uh, mitochondria available for amplifying DNA. And therefore more DNA to start with. Yeah. yeah, more DNA for getting sequences. It just makes our job a lot easier if we take it from muscle. But the mitochondrial DNA is not everything the squid has in DNA. It's just a part of its DNA. Is that enough? Oh, well, technically, there's two different lines of evidence. So mitochondrial DNA is only inherited from mum. Nuclear DNA you get from mum and dad. Uh, and so it is good to look at mitochondrial because you can get one answer. But it's also good to look at some nuclear genes or even the whole genome would be ideal to be able to look at. Is that feasible today? It's something that we're really hoping to do, is sequence the whole genome of a squid. Uh, there are, there's an entire group of people that are actually trying to look at cephalopod genomes at the moment. Um, colossal squid isn't on their list of what they're hoping for. So right now it's the giant squid, two species of common octopus, um, uh, pygmy squid, which are little tiny things. And so it would be really good to compare those sequences, once they get them for the whole genomes, with the genome of the colossal squid. So if we can do it, that would be really fantastic. The, the tissue should be good enough to get this for this you would you would need the nuclear dna from the nucleus in the cell but this should be a good opportunity to do that yeah it should be really good especially because this specimen is only a few months old uh, and so the longer tissue sits around uh, the more it could degrade but this uh, squid has been frozen fortunately for us and so we should be able to get some good dna from it are there any other samples that you've already taken or that you'd still like to take yeah, fortunately, we've been able to get stomach contents. And I'm fairly certain this is the first time anyone's gotten stomach contents from a colossal squid before. Um, and so it'll be really, really interesting to see what's in there. Because we don't know much about what they eat. We know they're eaten by sperm whales, but what they themselves eat is still one of those mysteries, right? Yeah, the only thing that's known so far is that based on stabilized isotopes. So you can look at um, the concentration of nitrogen and carbon in tissue and figure out where it is in the food chain. Uh, and so they know it's a top predator, we don't actually know what it eats. We think it eats toothfish because it seems to, but um, other than coming up on long lines, we don't actually know what they eat. So we do have stomach contents. Have you had a chance to look at it? Just in any more specific detail about it? <laughs> it looks like ooze. Some of it's kind of yellow, so I can't tell at all what's inside um, because we just took the stomach uh, and immediately tied it off and put it in the freezer. Uh, but once I get back to the lab where I can put things into the DNA machine, then it'll be good. So obviously there's a lot more work to happen when you guys get back to the lab, all of your samples, any genetic analysis, any chemical analysis. Yeah, so our work doesn't end after today. So there's still the fixing of the squid and also analyzing all of the samples that we're going to take back. So I'll have to do DNA extraction, run PCRs, do sequencing, um, and other tissues are going to be sent for other things as well. Are there any other samples that you're still hoping to take? This sounds like a good bounty already, but is there anything else that you'd like to take? Uh, personally, for my own work, there's uh, a few more things that I'd like to get. So uh, we're trying to swab the entire uh, squid to try to find bacteria. And so we've already gotten it from in and around the eye, uh, from the esophagus, but we'd like to get all surfaces and just see what kind of bacteria is on a squid. So are you thinking more parasitic bacteria or anything? anything. Um, because like we're covered in bacteria. We're actually more bacterial cells than human cells. And the bacteria in your elbow is different from the bacteria on the back of your hand. Or in my belly button. <laughs> or in your belly button. <laughs> so if it's so, something similar in the squid, that'd be really interesting to find out. So we're hoping to do that too. And we can safely assume that it will also be covered in bacteria. Yes, yes. It's very certain the squid is entirely covered in bacteria. <laughs> Great. Thank you for that, and good luck with the rest of the sampling, and we shall head back to the tank. Thanks very much, Heather Braid. So let's get this stuff out of Okay, 
so let's get the sharp things away from here. Okay, guys, we're going to try to turn it over. So, we're at a, a point now where we have had a look at the ventral side of the head. Um, we've actually got the beak out, we've got an eye out, which we're going to show you in a little while, and we're going to try now to turn the squid over because it's defrosted enough um, that we should be able to unfold it and flip it so that we can see the massive fin that's folded underneath um, and see the dorsal surface of the head for the first time and the other side of the head because as it's been defrosting, one of the eyes has been sort of pointing down and we don't really know what it looks like at all on that side and then we can look at that dorsal pair of arms we haven't seen yet either. Uh, so, have you guys got long gloves as well? We're going to bring the whole team in for this because it will be a multi-person operation to get it flipped over and, and unwound. And um, My gloves are already flooded so I'll just leave those on for this. So the first thing that we'll do is we'll um, rotate it around about 90 degrees so the arms are pointing this way again. Then we're going to flip the head over so that it's lying with the dorsal surface and then we'll see if we can unwind the mantle. Now, part of the head was still fairly frozen so um, we'll just remember to use the muscular parts if you can. So arms and uh, mantle and fins. So the first thing we're going to do is roll the head over, if we can. Yep, so I'm going to give Tyler a couple of arms, pull those arms towards you. Jesse and I will reach for the lower arms here and try to rotate it a bit. Beautiful. Okay. All right, so now we can see the dorsal surface of the head for the very first time. And so the squid has been folded around so that the head has been kind of sitting back on the dorsal surface of its body and we've got the mantle and fins up at this end and now so we've got the mantle coming up and we should have be starting to have access now to that massive fin which was flipped around under and there's still a bit of ice here so we're going to run the hose onto this part for now Mantle. The dorsal surface of the mantle, yeah. So the fins are still folded around underneath it that way, but we may be able to tease those out from underneath shortly. We're just going to run water into here to finish defrosting this particular crease, and we'll see then, just looking carefully at the, the this surface, because we haven't seen the surface before, looking for any evidence of things like interesting parasites or packets of implanted sperm we might be finding here as well. Uh, and then... We'll see if we can get the fin rolled out from underneath, and that will point down toward the end of the tank where Aaron is. So, Jesse, if you keep the hose there, I'll come around here and see what I can feel about the fin. is still lying right on the bottom. So what we would need to do is possibly have a second person in the tank, standing one on either side to lift this end of the mantle, and then we can ease the fin out from under. I'm happy to get in, unless you'd like to. Yeah. All right. We'll put Tyler in some waders, and then we'll, uh, we'll bring the fin up, and then we'll be able to see for the first time what the full length is uh, on the mantle as well. This is just a crease in the mantle here? Yeah. 
So the fin is lying right along the bottom of the tank, but it is pretty enormous. So we can have a look at this eye now for the first time as well. on camera, this is, um, this is the mantle, this is where the tube part of the body begins, and this is the squid's head, and uh, they're fused right here, and that's one of the characteristics of this family. So most squid at the point where the mantle and head come together are attached by muscles inside, and then in this, this outside part where the mantle overlaps the head, there are some sort of snap-like pieces of cartilage that can lock together but can also be free. And the way that the squid breathes is that it takes water into the mantle, fills it up, um, water goes over the gills, and then it contracts the mantle and sort of breathes out normally through the funnel or through the anterior margin. And when it needs to swim really quickly, it draws water into the mantle and then shoots it out the funnel and it contracts the mantle very rapidly. And um, in animals that tend to be very active swimmers, we see really, um, really complex cartilages there that snap together in, in very solid ways. And the cranchiids, the glass squids, have gone one step further, and they, instead of having snaps that can come together, their head and mantle is fused all the time. So we know that some of the smaller cranchiids are not very powerful swimmers, but a head-mantle attachment like that seems to suggest that it could be a very active animal. So perhaps that is true for the colossal squid. There's some debate about how how energetic a swimmer it is and, and what its metabolism might be like. Some estimates say that it's got a very low metabolism and might grow quite slowly, but um, its overall morphology suggests that it could also be a very powerful animal that could swim very rapidly if it needed to. So we got Tyler getting into waders. The boots are a bit small. The boots are a bit small. Yeah, ah. Waders. You know, right. Okay. <laughs> Alright. Erin, have you talked about glass squids yet? Mm -hmm. You have? Good. Alright. Well, I'm going to go grab um, some waiters. I'll be right back. <laughs> well, can you do Tyler's interview? Why don't we do Tyler's interview while you're going to change? Right. I think it's a strange issue. Oh, okay. That's actually good. I'm just going to. Well, just chill. <laughs> but I'm much. And welcome back in here. Now, while Kat's just getting um, ready to get into the tank, she needs some waiters and a wetsuit for that. So in the meantime, we'll talk to one of her students. I've got uh, Tyler Northern here with me, and your focus is not so much on the squid itself, but on its, on its environment. You're looking at ocean acidification. And in fact, we have a question from Emily Markovitz, who sent in asking, will you look for evidence of ocean acidification? And if so, how? Um, we will use some of the... Uh, some of the samples we collect today to look at ocean acidification. Um, so basically what we're going to do is we're going to get the hard parts. So we've got, I've got some sucker rings. Um, we may get a subsample of the beak if that's possible, but you know, we have to see what happens there. Um, and I will be putting those into uh, lower pH um, waters. So um, the, the pH that we predict that the waters will be within 100 years. Um, so that's around dropping from 8.2 down to around 7.8. So I'll put them in there and just see how they do. 
So, like, I mean, if the saccharines dissolve at, 7, at a pH of 7.8, um, they're going to be in contact with the water uh, all of the time while that squid's in the ocean. So that squid might not do so well without any saccharines. So this is the kind of impact that we might see in the future. But perhaps I could take you a step back and explain ocean acidification and how that's already affecting the Southern Ocean in particular. Yeah, so, I mean, as I'm sure you and most of the people at home would know, um, humans have been pumping extra carbon dioxide into the atmosphere since the Industrial Revolution. Um, what this does is it uh, gets taken up by the oceans, which is good for us because if it was all in the atmosphere, it would probably all be choking by now. Um, so the ocean takes up a good portion of that. But the problem with that is um, when, once the carbon dioxide gets into the water, it reacts. Um, one side effect of this is it decreases the pH, and another is that it um, decreases the amount of an iron called carbonate in the ocean. And this is what um, this iron is what um, lots of the animals make shells from. And when you have less of this um, iron or mineral in the ocean, it makes it a lot harder for these animals to keep, make and maintain their shells. So this is the shell builders in the ocean, but does that also affect the squid? I mean, is the beak and those hard bits in the suckers, are they based on carbonate? Um, as far as we know, most of, most of the hard structures are based on chitin, which is similar to what your hair is made of. Um, that's one of the other things we want to look at, is to see if in any of these hard parts there are um, structure, structural calcium carbonate, um, which would be affected. And there's also two little bones um, in, uh, in the, near the brain of the squid, which work like your inner ear. They're balanced organs, so they help the squid know when it's moving up, when it's moving down, how fast it's going. Basically gives it balance and orientation. Um, those are tiny. They're about the size of a quarter grain of rice and... For my squid, which are you know probably about that big, whereas I mean this squid's huge, but it still has tiny statoliths. Um, they're made of calcium carbonate and they're very delicate, so that is another side of um, what we'll be looking at. So they would be directly affected, while the other harder bits of the squid are different material, but they would still be affected by the the acidity or the the more acidic waters in the ocean. Yes, yes, they definitely will be. Um, the one thing, yeah. Chitin is less sensitive to lower pHs. It is still, will, you know, it does still dissolve in low, um, low pHs. Um, one of the things we want to see, as I said earlier, is that um, occasionally uh, they've found that within the chitin there can be calcium carbonate present, and if that dissolves, we, w we don't really know what the effects of that could be. So that's something we would like to check to see if there is calcium carbonate in those structures, um, like the beak and the sucker rings and the hooks. So you'll really only have the answer to this when you get back to the lab. So you're taking the samples now, but then actually putting them into this water with a higher acidity than we have in the oceans now will happen when you're back. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we can't... Um, unfortunately, we can't really tell anything at the moment um, just from looking at the specimen. But, yes, we should hopefully have some answers within a year or two. This colossal squid lives in the Antarctic or Southern Ocean, close to Antarctica, that is a part of the world's ocean that is moving faster as far as ocean acidification is concerned. Is that right? Um, yes, the Southern Ocean is cooler, um, and cooler water uptakes carbon dioxide um, at a faster rate. So more carbon dioxide going to the ocean means the pH will drop faster, um, and that uh, calcium carbonate uh, mineral will, uh, concentration will also drop faster, so the effects will be um, felt there first. Great. Thank you very much, Tyler. And uh, thank you all for sending in questions. As you've just heard, some of the answers will have to wait for a little bit until this team has gone back to the lab, done the work there. But Te Papa will post you or will keep you posted on all the results. So keep an eye out for either Twitter or, of course, on the webpage. But let's go back to the tank site for a bit. Yeah. It's a, a massive, massive fundamental. No, we haven't yet. So we're going to need mental links. <laughs> yes. I think what we'll probably wind up doing is actually taking all the samples pretty rapidly. Um, yeah. Are we on? All right. Welcome back. Uh, we are in the ever 
murkier becoming waters of this colossal squid tank. Um, but we're now at a point where the squid is defro is un obviously my brain is scrambled by standing in the tank next to this amazing animal. Um, the squid has defrosted enough now that we're actually able to sort of lay it out full length. And what we're going to do is take some of those standard measurements um, that we need to take in sort of a, a normal squid position, as Jesse will have shown you um, during his interview. So we want to know what the full mantle length is. We've got the fin unfolded here, so we're going to look at how wide and how long the fin is as well. And we're going to check these surfaces very carefully for things um, that we haven't been able to look at yet because it's been all folded under itself. So the first thing that we'll do um, is we'll get everyone to put hands sort of under the fin and we'll lift it up and give you an idea of exactly how massive the fin on this animal is. So you, can, you will see why it was that it was folded under the entire outside of the animal. We'll need to lift from that end to this end so that the water pours off and we don't have a pool of water in the middle of the fins. <laughs> Can I slide it down toward that end of the tank a bit as well? Nope, nope, the water's not going There we go. There we go. Okay, so I don't know if, um, oh, no, can, so yeah. Funny. So the fins are actually together almost half the surface area of the top of the tank here. So we're not going to be able to have the, the fins floating nicely to get a, a perfect shot of them, but you can see that there, the surface area here is about half of the, the surface area of the, the water that we're, some of us are standing in and others are luckily standing around. <laughs> um, so, and what I've got up here, I don't know if you can get a close up all the way up to this end, but sticking through the end of the fin here when, in my right hand is the very tip of the gladius. And the gladius is the squid's pen. It's this rigid structure that runs down the backbone of the animal. It's not a backbone, but gives a little bit of structural integrity. It runs right down the middle of the fins and all the way to the anterior mental margin. So when we measure the, uh, the length of this squid dorsally, we'll measure it from this point because we know that the length of the mantle should be just about exactly the same as the length of the gladius. And that in an animal that's been frozen and defrosted will be a more accurate measure than if we would just sort of measure the gelatinous tissue that we've got here. So I'm going to take your spot here. Can you grab a tape measure? And we'll see if we can get some measurements here. So the fins are in very beautiful shape. Because they've been folded under, they've been some of the most protected, and they have some really lovely, intact, sort of dark purple-red skin on them. Thank you. Great. All right. <laughs> All right. How's that going, guys? Fantastic. Yeah, fantastic. <laughs> might do is, because we can see the midline, we can just measure from the midline out to the perfect fin margin on this side at the widest point. So I think okay. and we'll just double that, but you need it in centimeters. Oh, yeah, I do. Is that about the right place? Yep. 99. So we're doubling that. 99. Can you just, I think you've got 66 there. I think you're looking at it oh, upside down. <laughs> 66. So we're going to go with about a, 132 uh, centimeters wide. Uh, Sorry, so you've been in the tank a long time. I've been time. in the tank a long time. All right, so let's see if we can get a mental length now as well. So we know we've got it measured up to the fin insertions. Yep. And that means that we can come down here and just measure. I'm going to try to keep the, the fins extended if I can. Okay, so 
So your fin insertions are right here. Okay. And we want to go to there. To there. Via this little groove. So, what have you got? Uh, that's definitely a 98. <laughs> 98, okay. Ooh, great. So that gives us, what, 2 point... Hmm? 2.16 meters should be the mantle length, then, I believe, which is a, a good size. We think 2.5 meters might be just about maximum size. Um, so we want to look very carefully now over, the, over this surface of the mantle. We've sort of had a quick look as we've measured, but just to make sure we haven't missed anything uh, in or under the skin. Yep. Very gelatinous. You can see quite a few sucker and hook imprints from where it's been sort of folded in on itself, so those things leave an impression. Um, but other than that, it really is perfect. is the dorsal surface of the head. Missing a bit of skin here. This is the other side. Uh, and we do need to do the measures and counts on the first arms as well, and on one of the pairs, of, one of the second arm pairs. So we need to measure and count three arms. Which of the arms are we missing? The right, two right, and one, in, and both one. Okay. Those three. Okay, so do two first? Yeah. Can we measure first? Yeah, sure. Okay. This is two left. Eleven point five. Just quickly. Eighteen suckers on, on the, the same, same arm. One. Two, four, six, eight, nine hooks. Seventy-six. The one that we don't have any for arm two. Or do we have both of them? Yes. Oh, we have both of them. You don't need to be yeah, oh, okay. Are you sure it was the side? We've got both arms two done? Okay, great.
do arms one. Okay. So arms one left. Sixteen suckers. Fourteen hooks. Uh, 88 suckers at the end. And measure. Mm -hmm. uh, about 94.5. Sixteen suckers, eight hooks, and a hundred and twelve suckers. All right, so we've had a good look at the arms. Now all of the arm tips are perfect, which is beautiful. Um, it means we're going to get really nice measurements and counts from the specimen. We should get a really good look at the morphology of the teeth in the suckers and the form of the hooks on the arms. Um, and it will be very good for comparative purposes with the, the previous specimen, which was about the same size. And um, now that we've got it sort of facing this way, what we might do is just see if we can get the mantle and fins up sort of near the surface. Obviously, it's a bit murky to see what it looks like underneath, but just to really give a good impression of the overall size of this animal. So we'll, we'll scoot it down toward this end a bit. The arms and tentacles will hang out down there, and uh, we'll try to get the mantle and fins up to the surface so you can get a, a good look at it. You guys want to... Hmm? Um, I, no, I think we'll need the, the head and arms will need to sort of sink a bit, and we'll try to just make this a little more buoyant. So if we get you two under the mantle a bit. Okay. Yeah. And Heather, no, Heather's got to have this one. He's got to get under this that side over there. Yeah. Got it. And then we'll slide, slide along here. Yeah, no, slip it off. Um, and we'll try to slide it down toward you guys a bit again. And I'll just uh, really, really hope that my waders are waterproof. Let's see if I can get under, under it a bit. All right. So now, hopefully, from that end of the tank. Aaron, if you can, can you get under it a bit? Sort of. It's kind of dragging on the bottom. Okay. <laughs> so really, um, you just want to give an impression of why this animal is called the colossal squid. So you can see five of us standing around it here. The fins take up half the tank. The mantle takes up another almost, well, makes it takes it up to about three quarters of the tank. But it's covered here, and we've got the arms and head sort of still submerged at that end. So if we had this animal completely laid out flat, which wouldn't be great for it because it would be out of water, um, it would pretty much take up this entire tank and then some. The arms would extend further down 
than that end. They would sort of be over the edge and down, sort of like the, that famous old bathtub photo of the Architeuthis giant squid specimen. But um, it's just an absolutely massive animal, and we really don't know that much about it yet, but um, every little piece of information that we've gathered today hopefully will help us understand it a bit better. And uh, we've still got a bit of um, tissue sampling that we need to do for those chemical analyses and a few more things, but overall now at least we've got a good idea of the proportions of this animal, and uh, we'll be um, comparing those with some of the previous specimens and making some good illustrations of it to show what it might have looked like in a, a slightly more lifelike state than the state that we've gotten to see it in here. I can feel that the gladius is in really good condition, so the, the pen that runs down the backbone is all there. It's a, a little bit crunchy, but um, it's definitely still intact running down the midline. Um, and again, the skin is just absolutely beautiful. It's, you can see it's a bit ragged in places because the tissue is a bit gelatinous, but this really, I, I think, is about the best that you're going to see unless the animal is alive. So just really in awe of it, standing next to it here. It almost looks here like there is there any kind of sculpture? Are there little papillae on the surface of the skin? So we're just noticing that there's some little tiny, tiny warts on the surface of the mantle as well. And the structures like this are known um, in this family of glass squids, and they have some some systematic importance. The squids are grouped a little bit by the nature of these tubercles, and those um, those haven't really been observed on a colossal squid before. They're very delicate, and you wouldn't know unless the skin was in really good condition, but something that we'll, we'll probably do is try to take a cl closer look at those as well. Wow, heavy. <laughs> How are we doing for time? Okay, all right. So um, I think we'll, we'll, I can feel that there's still a little bit of ice in here. So before we do the very final things we're going to do, we'll leave it just a few more minutes to do some defrosting. What I might do now is show you a little bit more about some of the pieces that we've got out. You can sort of see the, the fin disappearing down back into the tank here, but just unbelievably huge. Tyler got the, <laughs> the, oh, flooded, yeah, the flooded gloves. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So I'll hop out here for a second. All the grace of a scientist in waiters at the end of a long day. All right. So what I wanted to bring over and show here is that uh, before we flipped the specimen over, we could see that the eye was in really perfect condition uh, on the side of the specimen that was facing up. And so uh, we made the decision that this was really the first perfect intact colossal squid eye um, that was not, that didn't need to stay necessarily intact inside the specimen um, and might be of more use to science if we could take it out and have a look at it before perhaps putting it back in if the animal goes on display. So we removed the eye from the other side of the head um, by making a single incision around the bottom, which can be stitched back together later if needed. Uh, and what we've got now is the eye, the largest eye in the animal kingdom, sitting in a, a little square bucket here. So um, I'll see if I can... Bring it forward a bit so that you can uh, you can have a look. And it's still a little bit frozen inside, so you're looking at it basically from the top. We've got the the aperture here that you could see where the lens would sit, and this is the ventral surface. So here are those two nice light organs. We've got a little photophore here. That's the white band, and then that bigger crescent-shaped one that I was talking about stretches around the bottom of the eyeball here. And uh, around the back, if I turn this around, you can actually see a bit of brain tissue on the back of it as well, and that's great. We were really hoping we would get the chance to take a little snip of brain tissue. Um, there's some, some interesting genetic questions that we can ask about that, and what we can see just at a glance is that it's, it's kind of folded and crenulated in, uh, 
a way that I was not at all expecting from having looked at eye lobes of a couple of other species of squid. Normally there's quite a, a flat, um, simple disc of brain tissue that sits right behind the eye. But this looks much, much more complex than I was expecting. So what I might do is I'll see if I can get it down where you can maybe see it through the plastic box on the side there. So you can see here it's got some folds in it. And uh, we, I'm not going to make any speculations about the significance of that yet, but it's not at all how I was expecting it to look. So um, as the eye finishes defrosting, there's still some ice in the middle. We'll flip it over and sit it so that it's a flat disc, and then we can um, do some final measurements on it. And then we will fix it. We'll have a good look at the, the retina, um, see if we can do some histology on that, and uh, as well um, on the eye lens. So here's the other half of the lens. You'll remember we put the first half um, in the freezer as soon as we had it out, and this is the inside half. So once again, you can see a few of the layers are coming away on the outside, and you can see on the inside those growth rings as well. So, put that back over here to finish defrosting. And I meant to ask um, earlier, did we have any more questions that people wanted answered as well? We'll do a couple of questions, then we'll do, I guess, sort of a, a wrap up of everything for the day. Let me, let me just awesome join here. you. Yes, let me join you, tank side. Yes, come back. Now, How do you think is, it smells? We think it smells fine. Oh, it still smells fine to it still me. Still smells fine yes. to you. Good. You can keep it going it. for a few We're not hours. Not losing it yet. <laughs> now I have a whole stack of questions. Okay. I've just been waiting right. for this final session. The one that a lot of people have been asking is: Is it a boy or a girl? So we we were. Excited to find that out ourselves. Um, there would have been really good things we could find out either way. As it turns out, this one is a female, um, so it's got uh, some eggs up in the end of the mantle. We're not sure how close to ready to be laid into an egg mass those eggs are, uh, but we've taken some samples of them for some different analyses. Um, and we may have a look inside and see about um, the, some of the glands in there as well um, and see what we can find out about the reproduction in this animal. All of the specimens so far have been female, so is that a slight disappointment? No, not really. I mean, every it, it doesn't really matter what the sex is. We, I mean, we don't know a lot about the males yet, but we don't know that much about the females either. Um, so it may well be that you know at some point we'll get a chance to examine a male, and there will be some surprising things about it. But you know, I wouldn't wouldn't say that it was a, a disappointment at all. How could this be a disappointment? Look at it. <laughs> Beautiful. Now, one question that three people have actually asked mm -hmm. is, could you point out the giant axon ah. during the examination? Well, no, I can tell you where the, the giant axon is, but it's in a part of the mantle that, unfortunately, we're not going to get to see. So the, um, the giant axon is inside, well, they're actually, the giant axon is inside parts of the squid that we're going to have trouble seeing, and it has some, some different, very interesting nerve things about it. If we were able to open it ventrally and flip it open like um, Jesse did with the, the arrow squid, there is a very large pair of nerves called the stellate ganglia. So they're the star-shaped um, ganglia that sort of run to near the gills. And they, those actually look very, very impressive. Um, on this squid, at a guess, they might be about the size of my hand. So you'd see a band of nerve tissue sort of running down and then radiating out into this sort of starburst of nerves um, sort of around the gill region. Um, but in this squid, because the mantle is fused to the head here, um, we would actually have to cut it apart there and flip it open, which we're not prepared to do for this specimen. Because it might become a specimen for display yes. at some point? Yeah. So it's really to preserve it yeah. for the end. Now, another question that has come in a lot is, why is the water so brown and getting browner and browner? <laughs> what do you mean? It's beautiful. <laughs> so um, a lot of things inside the squid um, are not really designed for rough handling. Well, they're not designed at all, but they... Um, when we have a, a squid that's frozen and thawed, there's a bit of rupturing that happens. Um, I understand that as it was brought on board the ship, inevitably there was a, a little bit of damage as well. Um, and so what we've probably got floating around in here is a delicious soup of ink. 
uh, ruptured liver. So the squid stores quite a lot of lipids and fats inside a single cylindrical organ inside, which anyone who's ever dissected a squid knows that you must not rupture if you don't want liver juice everywhere. Um, I'm guessing, you know, we haven't seen inside the mantle yet, but I, I think probably there's a bit of that in here as well. There's probably some um, hemolymph, which is sort of the squid's almost blood. Um, you wouldn't really see that it's a, a very clear color, but it's actually pale blue. It's copper-based, not iron-based like our blood. Um, so all of those things uh, and probably some, um, some ammonium chloride as well, which is uh, what the squid uses in a big sack for buoyancy. That's probably all mixed up in there. So you've also answered another question. It's been okay. quite a frequent question. Does it have an ink sac? Yes. Yes, and it does. Is the ink bluish, blackish? The ink is a very dark black color, um, and when you release it into the ocean, it looks sort of like this. So uh, what we've got here probably is a, a very large puddle of fairly dilute squid ink, but if there is still some concentrated ink inside, we're actually planning on sampling that as well. Fantastic. Now I've got a question from Edendale Primary School in Auckland from Room 7. All right. How many hearts mm. does the squid have and how many eyes? All right. So the squid has two eyes just like you. Um, we've seen one very large one uh, and there would be another one on the other side. We haven't had a good look at that one yet. Um, but unlike you, it's got three hearts. So it's got um, one heart that pumps the blood around the body and one heart for each of the gills. So it's got two gills uh, and it pumps, the, where we have a four-chambered heart, where two chambers do the body and two chambers do the lungs, the squid has actually just got a separate heart for each of the sort of lungs or gills, and then one that sends it around the body as well. Great, thank you. One question all the way from the USA, okay. from a family in Kentucky. What are the claws, I'm assuming the hooks, mm -hmm. made of? Mm -hmm. Like a tooth or like a fingernail? Okay, so the, um, the hooks, the beak, and the gladius are all made of a substance called chitin, which is like, like your fingernails. So it would be used to, sort of similar to a cat's claws. If you can imagine you know, feeling a very, very large cat's claws, that's actually a lot what the colossal squid hooks um, feel like. And they're similarly catchy. So when we're in the tank moving around, uh, you have to be very careful because they do snag even on very smooth surfaces like your gloves. Which leads me to the next one. How powerful are the suckers? Could they give you a bruise, for example? They certainly could give you a bruise, yep. Um, octopus suckers definitely give a bruise. Squid suckers probably give you a nice bruise with a ring-shaped cut around the outside as well because they are quite sharp. Charming. Um, and that reminds me, actually, we wanted to show some of the swiveling hooks. We haven't got the tentacles on this one, but we have got one in the collections. So I might just see. Erin, do you want to go grab that jar? Could we bring them in now? From the collection with yeah. the... Um, yeah. Because we've got a few more questions yes, to that's wrap up for And then we'll show you what the swiveling hooks look like as well. Yep. Yeah, fantastic. Now, how long would it take for a squid to finish a meal? Oh, that's a great <laughs> question. Well, okay, so we'll, we'll hedge our bets a bit and say it depends what it's eating. And uh, they, squid can take quite a long time over a meal because um, obviously the, the beak has to cut everything down into those tiny pieces. Um, what we do know about squid is that they, um, they often will target an animal like a fish and they'll start to eat preferentially kind of at the back of the head. It's not very nice, but they, they sort of latch onto the fish. They go for a bit of a ride sometimes. There's a, a spectacular piece of footage, again, from the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute where um, a very small squid is taken on a fish called an owlfish. And the owlfish is about three times the length of the squid. But the squid is very strategically attacked right at the back of the neck. And what it does then is it holds on and the fish will thrash around a bit. But if it can't get away fairly quickly, the squid will start to eat through the back of the head and the neck. And once it's severed the spinal cord, then the fish is no longer struggling. And the squid then takes quite a bit of time, and it's sort of all up down, up one side, all down the other side, and then often it will just drop the head and the spine when it's finished. So it's got favorite bits, um, and it knows how to immobilize the fish so that it's got plenty of time to eat them. So, gruesome. Okay, so now that we've dealt with table manners, yes. there's a question about the other end. All right. Where and how does the colossal squid excrete waste? Okay. Um, the food comes in the beak, it comes up to the end of the mantle where the stomach cecum and the stomach are, gets digested there, goes through a few other bits and pieces, and then it comes back down a long tube um, called the large intestine, and that exits inside the mantle near where the funnel is. Um, so it does actually excrete inside the body, but then the waste is pushed out through the funnel and excreted out of the body in that way. Great, and I think behind you we have some of those Excellent. hooks. Yes, that's perfect. All right, so from the excellent collections here at Te Papa, 
we have got a colossal squid tentacle club from a previous specimen. And what that means is that although the specimen we've got in front of us has not got the tentacle clubs today, I can still show you what the swiveling hooks look like. So this would have been probably from a slightly but not that much smaller specimen of a colossal squid. Um, it, the tentacle clubs are often surprisingly small compared to what people are expecting, but the, the really cool thing about them is these hooks. And these are different from the hooks on the arms because they can turn all the way around. So this is the thing that seems to really fascinate people. So their natural position is likely to be sort of all facing this way. The body is here. This is the end of the tentacle. So they normally sort of sit like this, but if they really latch into something, then they, <laughs> let's not lose that in the tank, <laughs> then they can actually go all the way around in either direction in order to hold on and not be pulled out of the tentacle. And now actually you can see they go a little bit further. So I'm saying that they, they rotate through at least 720 degrees, which is two full rotations, is not an exaggeration. I'll turn it sideways here so you can sort of see the profile of those. And here it's got um, a pad of sort of suckers and bumps as well, which is like the ones on the stalks, and it uses those to hold the tentacles together at this end and then make a very, very capable pair of catching devices right at the end of those tentacles. BV, how to free yourself from that grip? It would. Yes, yes, I, being eaten by a squid is not a way I would choose Want to, to go. <laughs> go, no. <laughs> Luckily in the Antarctic, the cold water would probably get you first. <laughs> okay, can I ask you perhaps a last question for this session? Sure. Which kind of leads us to wrapping up. Will this dissection and research help us find and track colossal squid in the future? Ah, well, it might do. Um, we're, we know sort of roughly the location where this one was collected. Um, we don't have particular plans to, sort of, to track them in the future, but every live capture we get and every piece of information we can get from this one will help us understand them better. It will help us know where they're likely to be, um, where we might find them if we want to find them, if we wanted to go and look for them when they were alive, um, where they might be if we wanted to try to avoid them for some reason. Um, and so uh, really the information about where they are is a combination of our sightings and the information we get from predators. and to date, by far, the information we've had has come from predators. So every chance we have to make direct observations on a specimen like this helps us understand them a bit more. Great. Fantastic. Now, we've got a few more minutes. Could I perhaps ask you to reflect on the most exciting thing for you? Whatever you've seen today, you refer to the eye, the surprising mm -hmm. structure of, mm -hmm. of the tissue there. I was impressed by the beak, I must say. That's huge. Yes. <laughs> it's, always, it's always very impressive to look at the squid's beak. But I, this was the, by far the most perfect colossal squid eye that I've seen. And again, these, the structures are so delicate that when they are brought in, in all specimens of this family, um, you sort of expect that they're going to be long gone. You don't normally see a lens. You don't normally get to see the light organs so perfectly. So that was really spectacular. And seeing that you know behind it was a bit of something that we didn't quite expect that we'll have to look into more was fantastic as well. Um, and really, the, the fact that we have a specimen in good shape, but that we can get so much information from and still have in good shape, that's win-win. That's, that's just a, a perfect situation. Great. Thank you, Kate. Now, is there anything else you would like to do with this specimen? We probably will take a few more samples um, just of muscle tissue um, to, to freeze and to make sure that we've got um, enough tissue for various projects. Um, but we'll take them from some of the sites that are already damaged on the animal. Um, and then we'll go about the process of starting to fix it and prepare it for the next stage of its journey. Which could be display? It could absolutely be display. It could form part of the permanent collections here so that other researchers could come and examine it as well. Um, and that's the fantastic thing about being able to do the squid here is that we know that um, whether it goes on display or stays as part of the collections, it's, it's part of a, a spectacular array of cephalopod things that people from, from overseas and New Zealand can come and study and look at as part of this museum. So our, all of my students today are reliant on the collections at this museum, and this is just one extra amazing thing that is able to be investigated here. So the work will go on in your lab when you take the samples back, but of course also at Te Papa yep, with absolutely. this and specimen. We'll, and pieces of it will go to um, colleagues around the world as well. Great. Now, if we haven't been able to answer your questions, rest assured we will. You will write a blog answering some of those questions. You can also keep tuned into Twitter. Remember those hashtags, 
Squid Watch and Life, no, Science Life, Te Papa. Um, so you will get an answer to those questions, but for now we're going to have to wrap up. So I'll first thank you guys for doing all the hard work, and of course I'll thank you, our viewers, for join, joining us today for this Science Life session in Te Papa. I hope you see you again next time. Thank you very and much, the, and goodbye. And to the captain as well. For oh, yes, saving John, us this fantastic come in. <laughs> thank you, John. John. Here we go. Oh, well, it's been a pleasure. It really has. It's good to see that it's been treated well and, and um, yeah, provide some uh, really good information. Well, it's been fantastic to meet you, and, and thank you so much for this opportunity. You're welcome. Thank you all, and goodbye. Thank you. <laughs>